Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's Chicago Board of Education meeting. Today is May 22nd, 2019. We're holding uh, today's meeting in the boardroom at 42 West Madison Street. I am Frank Clark, and on behalf of my fellow board members, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Our order of business will be honoring excellence, our CEO report, followed by public participation, then we will adjourn and go into executive session, and after that we will return to start the voting process. As always, I'd like to remind everyone that courteous and civil behavior is highly desired and expected. Um, at this time, I'd like to note that several board, several uh, people have asked that we uh, provide a Spanish translation. Uh, if you notice, a couple of people have earphones on. They're not listening to music. Uh, they're actually listening to this board meeting. Uh, so it's been translated into Spanish. It's a pilot program, uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. We would very much welcome feedback from those people who are participating. I think it's a handful, maybe a half dozen, uh, that uh, have asked to do that. Some of them are in the overflow room also. Um, and with that, Madam Secretary, would you please lead us in the pledge? Thank you, Mr. President. Please rise. <coughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The regular meeting of Wednesday, May 27, uh, May 22, 2019 is hereby called to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. President. Member Furlong? Present. Member Garza? Present. Vice President Guzman? Present. Member Dr. Hines? Present. Member Goolsby? Present. President Clark? Present. We have six members present. There is a quorum, and I would also like to recognize Dr. Janice Jackson, our CEO, Joseph Moriarty, our general counsel, Latanya McDade, our chief education officer, uh, Elizabeth Kirby, the chief of diverse learner support services. I'm sorry, Elizabeth Keenan, <laughs> chief diverse learner support services officer, uh, Aisha Ahmed, our honorary student board member, and joining us today, um, our honorary student board member for the 2019-20 uh, school year, uh, Joshua Torres, and Aisha will introduce them um, shortly. Thank you very much. Uh, as it turns out, uh, today is Aisha's last board meeting. Uh, Aisha will graduate in June after high school. She plans on attending the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I was just down there this weekend. That's a great campus, a, a wonderful school, and I know that you will do well. Uh, we as a board have appreciated Aisha's comments and service to Chicago's Board of Education and the students in the Chicago Public Schools. Aisha, you have and are, you are a remarkable young woman. To show our appreciation, we have a resolution on the agenda and a little something for you. Uh, when do we give her a little something? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Aisha, and again, on behalf of myself and my, my fellow board members, we want to thank you for your work and your input uh, that you've shared with us. Uh, we also have uh, a um, the new honorary student, which Aisha, I believe you, what am I forgetting? Before uh, we proceed with that, Aisha has some remarks, and then her principal, Mary Beck, would like to address the board, if we may. Then why don't we do that? Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Aisha? Um, good morning, President Clark and respected board members and CEO Dr. Janice Jackson, Chief Education Officer Lactania McDade. This meeting marks the end of my journey as an honorary student board member and the end of my experience as a CPS student. This position allowed me to represent the entire CPS student body with my voice. I'm grateful that you often encouraged me to speak on, on behalf of students' experience in CPS and always listened. This year has been an eye-opening experience for me as I learned about all of the roles that leaders have in CPS and the time, energy, and thought that goes into every decision to ensure that every student gets an education to the fullest. I have built connection, explored possible future careers, and have been impressed with the efforts that board members make to address um, everyone's concerns even if this is not seen by the larger public. Personally, I have the opportunity to present various matters as a student to the board, and the amount of respect and attention I have received is astonishing. 
I am looking forward to becoming the proud alumni of CPS. I know that because of my experience both at Sand High School and as CPS Honorary Student Board Representative, I am prepared for the amazing things in the future. I will be attending University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and through the help of my counselors and mentors, I have received a fully funded scholarship. I'm so thankful. <laughs> I'm so thankful for this opportunity that was given to me at a, such a young age to represent the student, student body of CPS and encourage other student leaders to participate. Thank you, President Clark and board members, Dr. Dennis Jackson and Chief McDade for this honor. Thank you. Thank you. And her principal, Mary Beck, please. It's like, Kiki, where'd you go? Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm grateful to be here with my LSC chair, Kiki Kuchukas, uh, and for the opportunity to address uh, uh, the board and express my gratitude to President Clark, uh, respective board members, uh, CEO Dr. Jackson, and Chief uh, McDade uh, for the support and experience that you've provided Aisha this year and the similar support that you've extended to Sun High School. I'm so proud of Aisha, and I want to thank you for welcome, welcoming her to the board, because she represents not just Sen High School, but the voice of all Chicago public school students. Aisha was the perfect choice as the honorary school board member this past year, as she is committed to learning from new experiences, mentorship, and growth. Aisha's story is hers alone, but it is not unique to Sen. Aisha came to Sen as a neighborhood student with ESL supports and is standing here before you as a full international baccalaureate diploma candidate. As you've heard, she's also attending my alma mater, University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign on a full ride scholarship. I promise I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> kind of did. Um, and her commitment to her educational growth and the embodiment of the IB Learner Profile is a prime example of SEN's commitment to both equity and access as the first wall-to-wall -wall IB neighborhood school in Chicago. We want to thank um, both the board and the CPS Office of Access and Enrollment for their continued support of our IB program growth by allowing us to add the career program next year so that we can continue to ensure access to premier rigorous coursework for all SEN students. With this addition, we're not just a wall-to-wall -wall IB school, but a floor-to-ceiling IB school. Aisha is a prime example of what success looks like when we believe that students can and will achieve at every level. In addition to the CP program, Sen High School has also been supported this past year in, in a growth with renovation projects, a commitment to technology upgrades, and a thriving Sen Arts program. Personally, I've been lucky to participate in professional growth with the uh, Chicago Fellows Program. We are grateful for this opportunity to thank the board, CEO Jackson, Chief McDade, and all the support that we've received from uh, CPS Central Office. And we look forward to sharing with you many more exciting, sensational stories. <laughs> thank you. OK, Aisha, you're going to introduce the new honorary board member, student yes. board member. <laughs> um, thank you, President Clark. This is my pleasure to introduce Joshua Torres as the 2019-2020 Honorary Student Board Member. Joshua, would you like to say a few words? All right. So think, first of all, thank you very much, Aisha, and congratulations on your amazing work on this you know, amazing board. Um, my name is Joshua Torres, and I'm currently a junior at Prosper Career Academy. I'm an I, international baccalaureate diploma program student, and I am honored to have been selected as the honorary student board member for the 2019 and 2020 school year. <clears throat> Since my freshman year, I have served in the local school council as a student representative and as the vice president of the student voice committee. Uh, recently, I, I've also become the vice president of the National Honor Society, and this past summer, in 2018, um, I had the honor to uh, travel to Washington, D.C. with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute to uh, meet with our uh, congressmen and senators and create action plans so we can take back here to our local communities and implement them. This is truly an amazing opportunity, and I look forward to advocating on behalf of all CPS students around Chicago. I am currently working on my personal mission, and that is to encourage civic engagement among Chicago youth. We now have new leadership in our city, 
And now more than ever, it is more important to encourage our youth to become active in local politics and community affairs. So with that said, I would like to thank President Clark and the board members, and I look forward to serving on the board. Thank you all for the warm welcome. Thank you. I uh, thank both of you. Uh, both of you spoke very well. Uh, and uh, Joshua, I, I, I believe that you will follow in the footsteps of Aisha and you will have a voice uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. You're well spoken. Okay, let's proceed with honor and excellence. Good morning. We begin each Board of Education meeting by recognizing the talents and accomplishments of our students and school communities. Today, we will begin with a performance by a talented group of students from Washington High School who have helped kickstart a modern band movement at Washington and, sh and in Chicago's All City Arts program. Their recent performances include an appearance at Columbia College's Deep Dish Festival, the music festival at Harold Washington College, and the Little Kids Rock Jam Fest at the Metro. They have worked hard to hone their skills and under the direction of their music teacher, Peter Elrich, will now present us with Don't Let Me Down by the Beatles. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Robert Earp, Cosme Cruz, Giovanni Hernandez, Anthony Contreras, Savannah Pena, and Marcos Lopez. <coughs> Thank you. 
Will we have a speaker from the group? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys can. All right. Uh, so, hello. Uh, my name is Anthony. This is Postman, Joe. And uh, Savannah, and we got Robert. Uh, I just want to thank uh, everybody for um, here. Uh, thought of us. Uh, we're a little small place in uh, east side of Chicago, um, south east side of Chicago. And uh, we're just right on the border of Indiana. And it's really, like, awesome that you guys like heard of us and uh, are recognizing us and I couldn't be any more grateful and I know my band members either like they're it's amazing. Uh, we played a, so many gigs I can't even count we've been starting this since uh, <laughs> freshman year and it's just getting bigger and I can't wait for uh, senior year. It's gonna be amazing. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Next, it is my pleasure to welcome the 2018-2019 CPS Student Advisory Council. These students come from high schools all over the city and have dedicated their time and talents to advising CPS leadership on how to create a better experience for all of Chicago's students. Their focus this school year was on social and emotional learning. They work towards policy recommendations, that explored a mandate for new CPS teachers to be trained in SEL and for SEL and restorative practices to be introduced in in-school suspensions. The council also participated in district-wide student voice initiatives and developed student-led workshops on identity, healthy relationships, restorative practices, and SEL for the 2018 CPS Student Leadership Conference. So at our final Board of Education meeting of the school year, I want to acknowledge these students for their hard work and thank them for their contribution to our district. Please join me in welcoming the CPS Student Advisory Council, which is, which is formed by Maribel Barrera from Von Steuben High School, Sage Butler, Kenwood Academy, Havilon Bird, Alcott College Prep, Gerardo Chacon, Back of the Yards High School, Crystal Clawejo, Intrinsic Schools, Kendrick Davis, Chicago High School for Agricultural Science, Kate Albigen, Albigen, Jones College Prep, Imani Fleming, Lane Tech, Joe Gil Zoe Gilbert, Morgan Park High School, Roy Canal, Mather High School, Keon Katibi, Lincoln Park High School, Jonathan Lee, Northside Prep, Nick Lopez, Schurz, Cameron Morgan, Diet High School, Cassius Palacio, Brooks High School, Hernan Reyes, Phoenix Military Academy, Christopher Redmond, Epic Academy, Zach Robbins, Limbloom Math and Science Academy, Corinne Alter, Whitney Young, Skylar Travis, Simeon, Liliana Villa, Hancock, and Christina Yoon, Northside Prep. Liliana, would you like to say a few words on behalf of the council? Sure. Um, my name is Liliana Villa. I'm a senior at John Hancock College Prep, and I have served on the Student Advisory Council for two years now. Um, and I want to start off by saying thank you to the board for inviting SAC to be honored today. Um, during my time on SAC, I have learned many skills and have had many experiences. I developed my critical thinking, problem solving, communication, and leadership skills through intensive research on a variety of issues that affected CPS. I worked with a diverse, passionate team of students up here um, and collaborated and have conversations with CPS staff to influence policy. This year, as mentioned before, the Student Advisory Council did a lot of research around social emotional learning practices um, taking place in our schools and we worked toward policy recommendations that explored a training mandate for new teachers to be certified in SEL and to introduce SEL and restorative practice activities um, into in-school suspensions. We partnered with a lot of organizations such as the Office of Social and Emotional Learning, um, the Office of Social Science and Civic Engagement, CASEL, and many more. The council participated in district-wide student voice initiatives, um, and we developed youth-led workshops on identity, healthy relationships, restorative relationships, and SEL and everyday instruction for the 2018 Student Leadership Conference. We've also gotten really cool opportunities, like attending the book tour of one of our favorite girl bosses, second to Dr. Janice Jackson, Michelle Obama. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, with the district's dedication to social and emotional development to students, we were able to explore the different ways that we can provide support to students that will influence our policy implementation for the incoming school year. With our council being entirely um, student-centered, our work connects to the CPS vision within the integrity branch. The CPS vision mentions engaged students as education leaders. Our students are a powerful force for school improvement and we need their expertise and energy. This connects directly with the work of SAC because this council is committed toward empowering youth and their SVCs and creating spaces for youth all across the district to have conversations on how to improve the quality of life, education, and success for CPS students. Our work is influenced not only from our research and the leaders we meet, but also from our own experiences and those around us. My time in SAC has ultimately impacted where I see myself in the next 10 years. I'm happy to say I will be attending UIC in the fall with a major in political science. I decided to major in political science because my time in SAC has shown me the power of policy and how policy can create active change. SAC has also built my confidence and sense of self, which has, built, um, which has encouraged me to be a leader in spaces where women of color aren't represented enough. After college, I plan to hold a local office position in Chicago. That way, I can continue my legacy in being an agent of change. I want to thank my fellow council members for encouraging the district to push boundaries and dedicating the year to making CPS more equitable. Finally, I want to thank Dr. Janice Jackson for your commitment towards student voice and allowing us the access that you've given us to creating change. Thank you. Any comments, board members? Wonderful example of young leadership. Uh, and I expect that we'll be hearing and probably seeing more of you in the future. Thank you so much, all of you. One, one thing, President Clark, if we could have just the seniors say their name in the schools that they're going to be attending. Please. Yes. We can start. Well, Asha, you already oh. said it. <laughs> My name is Asha. I will be attending the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. As mentioned, I'll be attending UIC. Uh, my name is Kianti Phoebe. I will be studying education at Illinois State University. Yay. My name is Christina Yu, and I'm going to be attending University of Michigan Ann Arbor. My name is Jonathan Lee. I'll be attending Stanford University. Okay. My name is Kate. I'll be attending Wesleyan University. My name is Sarah Barrera, and I'll be at the University of Wisconsin Madison. <laughs> my name is Joel. I'll be attending. Uh, my name is Nick. I'll be attending the University of Illinois. All right. Outstanding. Yeah. It's, a, it's been a pleasure. Um, I've been working with this group for a few years now, and some of you are graduating. It's a little, it's a lot, so I, don't ha I can't <laughs> get everything out. But I just want to thank you for your service, and you are so smart and well-researched and well-informed and you have good intentions. So I fully expect you to come back and do everything that you know, mm -hmm. you've said you're going to do um, and to come back and serve this city. So I couldn't be more proud of all of you. So congratulations and have fun, not too much fun, and <laughs> come back and, and serve the city because you're definitely ready to do it. You've already proven that. So thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to welcome Ms. Amanda Zarez, who was named the Elementary Counselor of the Year and the Illinois School Counselor of the Year by the Illinois School Counselor Association. Amanda has been a counselor at Pritzker School for 11 years. Thanks to her leadership and collaboration with the Pritzker team, attendance and on-track rates are trending up. Disciplinary action is down and restorative conversations are being held to help students excel in their social and emotional learning. Amanda looks at every practice through a lens of equity and works to present ideas and solutions that will make a difference for every child. When asked what is so great about their counselor, one of her students said this, she is always there for me and I know I have someone to talk to when I'm having a hard time. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Amanda Zarez on being named 2019 Counselor of the Year.
Thank you to the members of the Board of Education for inviting me here today to recognize my accomplishments. I truly believe that my award as the Illinois School Counselor of the Year represents what school counselors can do and how they can impact students when they're allowed to work directly with students. Um, and thank you to Dr. Jackson. You've been a huge champion for school counselors. And because of your support, I'm able to be better for my students. I'm proud to serve my students as their advocate, as their sounding board, and as their cheerleader. I work every day to make them feel valued and supported to be there for them when, no one, when they feel like no one else is, to help them reach their goals. I am honored to represent Pritzker School and Chicago Public Schools as the 2019 Illinois School Counselor of the Year. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and I'm not sure if we said it in the comments, but this is the third year in a row that Chicago Public Schools won. So we are very proud of all of our counselors. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're joining a great group of folks. So. We will now move on to um, a CPS student who is excelling in everything from languages and robotics to chess, service, and high stakes academic competitions. Let's begin with Arturo Ballesteros, a junior at Back of the Yards High School who earned a perfect score on this year's AP Spanish Language and Culture exam. I, I did say perfect. <laughs> Much of Arturo's success goes back to his family, who has done an excellent job of keeping Spanish alive in their home. Arturo prepared diligently for this exam and was the only CPS student and one of 100 students in the entire world to receive a perfect score. His teachers state that he is considering pursuing a career in education. So we're extremely excited about that. Please join me in congratulating this exemplary Spanish scholar. Good morning, members of the Board of Education. For, uh, as stated, my name is Arturo Ballesteros. And firstly, I'd like to say that I'm honored and thankful for having been invited here today. Um, the Chicago Public School District has provided me with an excellent learning environment as well as many valuable opportunities. So I know that much of my achievements are due not only to myself but also to my teachers, the administrative staff at my school and my school in general. And so as I wrap up my high school career in this upcoming year, I hope to and look forward to seeing how the Chicago Public School District continues to provide resources and opportunities for both teachers and students to continue to develop not only academically but also personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you. <laughs> okay. Well, I do want to acknowledge the proud principal of Back of the Yards, Dr. Patty Brecky, for being <laughs> here with her student. And by the way, Arturo, she told me that you were, you were very shy and you didn't like all this attention. <laughs> but guess what? You deserve it. So congratulations. <laughs> Let's move on now to my alma mater, Whitney Young, mm -hmm. where the academic decathlon team once again captured a state championship for 2019. This makes 34 <laughs> state championships for this team in the past 35 years. <laughs> That's great. I said 34 out of 35. <laughs> I want to thank coaches uh, Julianne O oh and Michael Stevenson for their incredible leadership of this team and congratulate them on leading Whitney Young to a third place finish in this year's National Academic Deca Decathlon Competition. Please join me in welcoming both of them along with their talented team. Is your coach here? Yeah. Right. Hi, good morning, Ms. McDade. Good morning, board. Um, so I have here with me the members of Whitney Young's uh, not just state championship academic decathlon team, but also placed third in the nation uh, at the national competition back in April. This is the fifth top three finish in the last five years uh, that this team has had, so uh, enormously successful. Um, and this year in particular, their success uh, is noteworthy given that uh, the academic decathlon competition has opened up to international teams as well. So there were schools there from uh, both the UK as well as China, mm -hmm. and uh, third highest score um, in Division One by Whitney Young. It's mm, great. 
Uh, last, in the spirit of honoring excellence, uh, we must honor um, Whitney Young's captain, Joseph Radinsky, who not only has been just an exceptional uh, leader throughout the school year, um, but also had the second highest score at the entire competition among uh, hundreds of competitors. Uh, with that said, I'd like to give uh, Joe Radinsky an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. Hi. Um, okay, so uh, first I guess I'll tell you guys a little bit about what ACADEC does or the Academic Decathlon does. So the Academic Decathlon is a 10-subject sc uh, scholastic competition where we study through uh, the lens of a central subject uh, or a central topic this year, the 1960s, through different subjects including economics, including literature, including music. Um, and in addition to seven of those objective subjects, we also have events in interview, essay, and speech. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the prepared speech I did this year. So the topic that I chose to pursue was about quantifying our lives and sort of using data as a tool or as an overbearing tool in trying to organize our lives in a way that can sometimes block out other perspectives or narrow our perception of the world around us. Um, and one of the reasons that I chose to pursue this topic was because of my experience as a CPS student. Uh, in the past decades, my peers and I have seen an increase in the number of standardized tests that we've had to take and in the emphasis on GPA and the emphasis on test scores in not only our individual self-worth, but also the worthiness of our schools. In the past decade, starting in 2012, we've seen 50 schools, neighborhood schools being closed predominantly on the south and west sides because of seemingly uh, underachieving test scores or underachieving students. However, uh, I feel like our school district has not recognized how flawed this system of using uh, predominantly standardized tests to determine these metrics, how flawed that system can be, and how narrow-minded it is when it comes to facing the biases, the inherent biases in this test that automatically uh, give, pre give uh, white students, upper middle class students from the north side an advantage in this. So the reason that I'm saying this is because I just want to implore everyone on the board and all of CPS really to consider that every student is worth more than a score and that I hope that we can come up with um, a system that more fairly allows for a distribution of resources between schools, especially with public neighborhood schools. Um, and yes, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. Good morning, I'm Ms. Little, I'm the assistant principal at, of Whitney Young. I'm here on behalf of Dr. Kenner, and we just wanna say, um, we thank the board for continuing to fund and support the academic decathlon program, as well as Whitney Young. <clears throat> it gives an opportunity to, for students to um, put their best foot forward and become the best students that they could possibly be. So we wanna thank the board for continuing to fund and support the academic decathlon program. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there anyone else speaking? Uh, no, sir, we open it to questions if you have Board any. Board members, any comments? Comments? Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I can see why this group uh, plays so highly, both uh, locally and nationally. Uh, and by the way, young man, your, your comments were concise, logical, thoughtful, uh, and uh, there was an element of concern for your fellow man that was inspirational. That's wonderful comments. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Next, we are thrilled to welcome the members of the Ogden Robotics team who recently won the first Midwest Regional Competition and then went on to compete in the Robotics League World Championship in Detroit. They competed against teams from more than 70 countries in front of an audience of over 35,000 people. By participating in this robotics program, the students at Ogden are mastering STEM skills, learning sophisticated software, and competing with robotics they designed. This experience can lead to paid internships and even college scholarships for these students. I want to thank the coaches and support of this program and ask you to now join me in congratulating these extremely talented students. Do we have a student speaker from Ogden? One of the skills I've developed and things that I've learned in Say your name. Uh, robotics are teamwork. Oh, my name is Wallace. Hi, Hi, Wallace. Hi, Wallace. <laughs> and I'm in sixth grade, and I'm 12. <laughs> um, 
One of the skills I've developed and things that I've learned in robotics are teamwork. I got used to my teammates, made friends with them, worked with them, and I also learned how to adapt with changing cir circumstances, such as when a certain teammate wasn't here that we needed, or a robot is acting weird on a certain mission. And um, some fun things about being on robotics are um, every year we get to do the same thing, but um, this year's competition this year's competition themes changes every time and new to mate teammates join and yeah they they change up the the board game in a fun and surprising new way thank you okay. before the next speaker i have to ask did you write that speech Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my hat's off to you. You speak so well. You 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 have a voice. You might be uh, announcing sports events or something. <laughs> uh, Twelve years old, yeah. remarkable. Right. Okay. Good morning. My name is Arlene Baena, and I am a junior at Ogden International High School. I would like to start off by thanking the Board of Education for inviting the Ogden Robotics team to today's meeting. This year has been a very big year for us, as we, the Owlinators, have advanced to FRC's World Championship in Detroit, Michigan, by winning the Rookie All-Star of the Year. This was definitely a learning experience for the entire team that we hope to keep growing and go further on in the years to come. The FRC robotics teams are not only made up of programming and, and the process of building the robot, which is important, but also require other roles in need of for the team to succeed. Roles that are behind the scene, like the marketing that funds our teams, the artistic skills that creates our t-shirts, and the leadership that keeps our teams on check. This, this has been my second year on the team, and throughout this time, I have learned things that I may not have been able to do in a normal classroom setting. This environment allows my teammates and I to learn multiple skills at once. I came in knowing nothing about building or even basic hand tools, and little by little I am learning while also le learning to become, um, to become a better leader with a little bit of elect electronic knowledge, but that is still being worked on. <laughs> <laughs> we are nothing but blessed to have a robotics team that is a part of FIRST. Each of my teammates have started off with one skill that they have brought to the table and continue to grow, <laughs> that they t continue to grow on that one simple skill. We made it far once and we have plans to make it even further next year and in the years to come. Uh, and we continue to hope to grow as a team. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any other speakers? Um, the principal will be speaking also as well as the coach, I do believe. Okay. Good, at, good morning. <laughs> Still morning. Good morning. My name is Paul Bierbauer. I was the coach of the FRC team that went to World. I'm one of the three coaches for this Ogden Robotics group of teams. I want to just tell you a, a minute for just what these kids have accomplished. This is not a kit. Mm -hmm. This is engineering at its finest. It's a blank sheet of paper. They have six weeks to figure out how to design and build a robot and make it work. They're learning all kinds of skills. They're learning troubleshooting skills. They're learning people skills. Employers and colleges beat a path to their doorway. What parent wouldn't like to have their son or daughter hanging out after school, designing and building a robot, and not hanging out out on the streets? These are real, honest-to-goodness skills that these kids are going to take with them to college and they're going to take with them to the workforce. Uh, you know, it was pointed out that uh, earlier today that 50% of incoming freshmen to, to universities, I taught in universities for 37 years, 50% of them are going to eventually fill jobs that haven't even been defined yet. Hmm. We're teaching these kids how to be problem solvers. That's what the world needs. Yeah. These kids are learning all kinds of skills, not just how to design and build a robot. They're learning how to develop an organization. They're learning interpersonal skills. They're, they're learning graphic arts. They're learning communications. These are going to be the contributors of the world in the next generation. Yeah. 
agree. I implore you to please pay attention to, to programs like FIRST Robotics. These kids are just absolutely incredible. I've worked with I don't know how many teams over the years. Thir this is my 13th year in FIRST Robotics. This is the best group of kids I've ever had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as Mr. Clark pointed out, they're already becoming very articulate. They're used to this. Okay, I'm going to get down. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. For it's a bottle of Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Bancroft. I'm the acting principal at Ogden. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the Board of Education for inviting us here today. It is truly an honor to, to represent academic excellence here today. As a school community, we are so proud of our amazing Ogden Owlnators robotics team. I also want to thank our coaching staff who has been under-recognized through this process. Uh, we've got parents, we've got former parents, members of the science and robotics community who give up uh, numerous hours to, to coach and, and be with our kids. So thank you to all the coaches who are here today. And lastly, to our future engineers, doctors, scientists, you are the reason we are here today. You have demonstrated an incredible level of intellect, problem solving, decision making, and passion for this craft. Keep pushing yourselves because I know you all do great things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any comments? Okay. Um, I'm associated with the Museum of Science and Industry. And uh, they had their robotics exhibit uh, a bit ago. Uh, did uh, any of you attend that uh, and, and, and uh, get any? Yeah. That's really outstanding. Uh, I want to be clear, both young speakers did a phenomenal job. Uh, I just I, I just asked the young man first. I, it's, I usually don't ask a female her age, <laughs> but it's okay because you're so young. <laughs> uh, how old are you? I am 17. You know, uh, I, I, it, there's almost nothing uh, more intimidating uh, than public speaking uh, when you don't do it all the time. And for the both of you to come up to the mic uh, with a command of your subject matter and your presence, it was just outstanding. I want to commend both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ogden, and congratulations. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> That's great. Next, we are thrilled to, well, this is our, our we had so many um, school communities represented here today, which is really an example of the boundless talent in CPS. And finally, um, on to ch a chess dynasty on the south side, we're pleased to recognize the chess team from Earl, which placed among the top five teams in the 2019 National Junior High School Chess Championship held last month in Texas. Earl was the only school from Illinois to have competed in this elite tournament. In addition to their impressive team finish, three members of the team also received individual trophies. And so we want to just um, recognize and thank Earl's co chess coach, Mr. Joseph O'Cool, for building up such an outstanding program at this school. Mr. O'Cool started the chess club at Earl when he arrived in 2015, and his goal was to give children a way to build their critical thinking skills and to show them the connection between success in chess and success in life. They've won many tournaments, but as Mr. O'Cool continuously reminds his students, that their trophies and medals will eventually lose their luster. What will continue to shine is the stamina, dedication, and character that students build while becoming masters of this game. Unfortunately, the Earl team could not be here with us today, but we wanted to acknowledge this remarkable accomplishment. So congratulations to the Earl chess team. U.S. News and World Report recently came out with its state-by-state -state breakdown of the top high schools in the country. We are proud to say that 20 of the top 100 high schools in Illinois, Illinois are right here in Chicago, and the top five slots were filled by CPS schools. The top-ranked high school in Illinois was Walter Payton College Prep, which also ranked ninth overall in the country. Peyton was followed by Northside Prep, Lane Tech, Whitney Young, and Jones College Prep. Brooks, Phoenix Military Academy, Lynn Bloom, and Lincoln Park were also among the top 20 high schools in the state of Illinois. These outstanding school communities represent just a fraction 
of the high quality high schools in our district that are preparing Chicago's youth for a successful future after graduation. We congratulate the students and educators who are working so hard to make our schools the very best high schools in the state and thank our families and community partners for their support in solidifying Chicago's reputation as a national leader in urban education. Students from high school through pre-K are receiving a rigorous, well-rounded education that meets the needs of the whole child. This is evident in the findings released this month by Ingenuity, one of our district's most valuable partners in the arts. In its annual State of the Arts report, Ingenuity shows that 65,000 more students have access to arts education than just six years ago. 105,000 are more are now receiving the recommended 120 minutes per week in arts instruction, and more than 100 additional arts organizations are partnering with Chicago Public Schools to enrich the experience of our students. We thank Ingenuity and the City of Chicago for partnering with us to help children tap into their creativity, explore other cultures, and build their self-confidence. We look forward to strengthening these partnerships as we work together to give CPS students the arts education they need to create, innovate, and to follow their passions. <coughs> With Memorial Day weekend just a few days away, the unofficial start of the summer season is upon us, and we want to make sure that Chicago's children have plenty of opportunities to stay active and engaged during these months. CPS will offer, continue to offer meals and activities through our safe haven sites, and there are a wide variety of summer activities offered through both the Chicago Park District and the Chicago Public Library. We encourage families and educators to explore these opportunities at chicago.gov forward slash summer and help children stay safe, challenged, and engaged throughout the summer. Finally, today, I want to offer my sincere congratulations to the CPS class of 2019. Graduation ceremonies will be happening across this city over the next few weeks, and we could not be more proud of what our students have achieved. The CPS communications team is working hard to celebrate those success stories and share what our students have planned for their future, some of which you heard today by the many students that shared their future plans after graduation. But I urge everyone to follow CPS on social media and hashtag Better Make Room Chicago next month as we highlight the successes, hopes, and dreams of our graduating class of 2019. I will now turn, we can clap for our 2019 yes. graduate. <laughs> there is in, truly endless talent in Chicago Public School students. I will now turn things over to our CEO, Dr. Janice Jackson, for the CEO report. All right. Thank you, Chief McDade. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that this week is a historical week, um, not only in our country, but in particular in our city. We inaugurated our first ever female African-American mayor here in Chicago, ushering in a new era of leadership for our great city. I want to congratulate Mayor uh, Lightfoot on her election, and I am proud to work with her as we continue to build on the phenomenal academic progress that Chicago Public Schools has made in recent years. Um, I also uh, would like to uh, acknowledge uh, some transitions that are occurring here um, in our office. Um, as Latanya just pointed out, um, we're coming up to the close of the end of the school year, and there, we had another successful year that we are extremely proud of as a school system. But for some, this juncture marks a uh, time for opportunity. So today I'd like to recognize a few members of my team. Some are present here today. Uh, others could not be here. And just congratulate them on the new uh, opportunities that they will be uh, taking on in the coming months. Although we will miss them personally here, um, the district is proud of the work that they've done and respects their leadership. And we're also honored to know that Chicago Public Schools continues to be a leader and an innovator and a place where people seek out talent because of the great work that people do on behalf of our children in this district. First, um, I'd like to announce that Jenny Bennett, our former chief financial officer who's presented here on many occasions, will continue her service for Chicago, but working directly with our new mayor um, as the chief financial officer for the city of Chicago. Next, we have Liz Keenan, our Chief of Diverse Learners and Support, I'm seated next to Chief McDade, who will be leaving the district to become the new superintendent of the Special School District of St. Louis County, Missouri. We should clap so she's in the <laughs> <way>. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, also, Liz Kirby, our Chief of School Strategy and Planning, um, who oversees all of our networks, who could not be here today, will be going back home to her home state of Cleve uh, of Ohio to serve as the new Superintendent of Schools for Cleveland Heights University Heights City School System. Um, yeah, we should clap. For <laughs> She's been here. Chicago Public Schools for 20 years. We're really proud of her. And lastly, the Illinois State Board of Education has hired Chief Ernesto Matias, our Chief of Language and Cultural Education, as the new Chief Ed Officer for um, the state of Illinois. We could not be more proud of all of our CPS um, officials who are going on to do bigger and better things. I also like to acknowledge, I know some of them were present here today, um, the more than 200 local school council chairs that I had an opportunity to meet with over the past uh, month or so. We held four meetings throughout the city um, because we wanted to check in and talk directly with our local school council chairs and make sure that they were not only uh, well versed on the vision for Chicago public schools, but also acknowledge their role that they play in that. Our LSC chairs have a unique perspective into their school communities, and we want to empower them, um, do a better job empowering them as leaders in their respective schools and as leaders in the district. I want to thank all of the local school council chairs that attended those meetings. In particular, I want to thank them for their time and their candor, and we look forward to acting upon the many recommendations that were outlined in those meetings, including strengthening partnerships with parents and improving the opportunities for parent training and support. We know that the district has made historic academic progress in recent years, and that is all thanks to our outstanding educators. But despite these impressive gains, our students have made, despite the impressive gains they've made, we know that access to high quality instructional materials continues to vary from school to school. We recently surveyed more than 500 CPS teachers across the district, and it was clear that far too many of our teachers have not received the curriculum development and support that they need and deserve. Teachers are spending their valuable time and money searching for and designing and purchasing classroom materials on their own to meet the diverse needs of our students. I personally consider that unacceptable um, for a district that has equity at the heart of its five-year vision. As a first step to make good on our plans around equity, we want to fulfill this important need. Last week, we announced that we are embarking on a first-of-its-kind curriculum equity initiative to ensure that all students have access to a high-quality digital and print-based learning activities across the city. Over the next two years, CPS will develop an online library of resources for six subject areas, extending past just the four core. We will include English and language arts, math, science, social studies, as well as Spanish and French. The curriculum will also be inclusive of our English language learners as well as our students with disabilities, and it will also celebrate the rich culture and diversity of our students in this great city. It is important to note that the curriculum will be optional to allow schools with well-established learning resources to maintain um, or supplement their existing curriculum. And for teachers who don't have access to a high quality curriculum, they will be able to now access that digitally as well as in print so that their students are presented with the highest quality learning activities to meet their needs. Teachers can choose to fully adopt this curriculum or use it as a supplement to the already um, ex exciting and innovative lessons that they bring to the classrooms every day. One of my top priorities for this initiative is to ensure that the materials we develop reflect the feedback and the experience of our teachers. And next month, we're releasing a formal application for teachers to join the CPS Curriculum Collaborative. This collaborative will be comprised of more than 100 Chicago teachers from every grade level across the city who will work with us between January 2020 and, I'm sorry, who will be a part of a formal review process as we work to release the curriculum in several phases beginning January 2020 and then in J July 2021. Our goal is to make the curriculum the most trusted source of high quality materials for our educators in the city. We believe we will save teachers valuable time and money while also ensuring that all students in every corner of the city receive the same high quality education they deserve. At this time, I will now ask our Chief Education Officer, Latanya McDade, to give a more detailed presentation on the Curriculum Equity Initiative um, that the board will be asked to vote on today. Chief McDade. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
<laughs> good, good morning. Good morning. And um, greetings to our uh, board president, President Clark, the entire board, and CEO, Dr. Jackson. I am so excited to bring before you the Curriculum Equity Initiative because this is something that we believe will be transformational for students and teachers throughout this district. And so Dr. Jackson talked a lot about uh, the purpose of the curriculum. What I would like to do is really share with everyone some of the data and research that we have um, collected over time um, as a part of this project. The impetus for the for the Curriculum Equity Initiative is really driven by our ambitious five-year vision that was released earlier this year under the, the direction of our CEO, Dr. Janice Jackson, which, as she already stated, is deeply rooted in equity for every student in this district. We have three core commitments around academic progress, financial stability, and integrity. And when we look at the Curriculum Equity Initiative, it really speaks to all three, but heavily uh, driven by high quality, rig rigorous instruction, making sure that every single student in this district has high expectations and access to excellence through uh, curricular resources, and making sure that we're preparing our teachers and, and, and principals and administrators to provide the, uh, to every need uh, that is represented in their building by making sure that we're treating them as professionals and giving them the resources that they need to do just that to support our students. And when we think about safe and supportive schools, while we also know that um, the physical safety is important, we have made a core commitment to make sure that every, every school is, uh, every classroom is student-centered. And safety is also about um, social-emotional safety for students, making sure that our students have a sense of identity and that they are represented in their classroom by way of their culture and their history. And so that's a part of the curriculum uh, project as well. So. First, I want to kind of revisit earlier this school year. I came before the board and shared extensive data around how we are doing as a district around both student growth as well as attainment. And what we saw that is as a district, all tides are rising. Our students are really doubling down on growth. But when we disaggregate the data, we also recognize that when it comes to attainment, there is still a disparity in terms of performance and that persistent um, opportunity gap exists. And we're saying opportunity gap as, a, as opposed to achievement gap because we recognize that it's not because our students aren't capable of achieving at high levels. We have to make sure that we're providing the right opportunities for them to have access to the kind of excellence in education that prepares them to be successful. So I want to take a look, just revisit the attainment piece. When we look at the attainment um, data that I presented earlier, again, it just shows the gap that exists in terms of performance for our black and brown students. Looking at that goal bar, the, the line that is represented by zero is the actual district average and you look at that goal bar represents our um, our African American students where it's showing that they are uh, faring at about 13 percent below the district average for attainment and our Hispanic students are slightly above at 2.2 percent same thing holds true for reading attainment when we look at reading you look at the district average um, which is that middle bar at, at representing the district and our African American students in terms of students um, meeting uh, attainment is 10% below the district average and for our Hispanic students 1% above and when you compare them to their uh, grade level peers that number widens. Same thing holds true for high school. So when we look from elementary across high school in terms of performance, here just revisiting um, 9th, 10th, and 11th grade assessments around college readiness benchmarks and looking at um, the gap that exists for our Hispanic and Latino students in terms of performance across all three of those assessments. And when you combine all of the assessments, 35% um, of our students are meeting college readiness benchmarks on the SAT and 41.3% when you combine all three grades of SAT 9, 10, um, and then for 11th grade. And so when we look at this, when, when I came before you and uh, many of the board members stated to me, what are we going to do about the opportunity, that a gap that exists for our black and brown students? And we really took a hard look at that and we identified within our five-year vision some really high leverage strategies that we want to implement within the district to address some of the equity issues that exist. And one of them really focuses, have this curriculum um, project really focuses heavily on how we have to transform the instructional core. So I want to share a little bit of research from Richard Elmore where 
I, it is identified that in order for us to improve the instructional core, there's three ways to do that for student learning at scale. The first one, recognizing that we have to increase the level of knowledge and skill for our te that our teachers bring to the in instructional process. Number two, um, which specifically is focused in the Curriculum Equity Initiative, is increasing the level of complexity of the content um, that our students are asked to learn. And third and most important, the role of the student, making sure that the, the classroom is student-centered and students have an opportunity to have identity and have ownership over, those over their learning. And the, those three work in tandem in order to transform the instructional core. The Curriculum Equity Initiative speaks to all three. And I want to just uh, highlight the four challenges that we found from looking at both national data as well as local data from the survey that Dr. Jackson uh, mentioned of the teachers, uh, the sample that we took across the district. We found four major challenges. The first one um, is around equity. Um, inconsistent access to high quality curriculum and curricular resources across the district, meaning that you can walk into a biology classroom in, in one side of town and a, the same biology class on another side of town and find two totally different levels of expectation and access to curriculum, and that's unacceptable. The other thing is time and administrative burden. Again, Dr. Jackson mentioned in her notes that teachers are spending an inordinate amount of time just searching the web, and that doubles when you tack on the time that it takes for planning for, um, for instruction. Third challenge is around quality. So when, when our educators are, have to resort to searching for um, information and content on the web, there's no vetting for quality. And so what they get back may not be aligned to uh, rigorous standards like Common Core and may not be grade level appropriate. And then fourth, the disconnect between professional learning and instructional materials. We spend across this nation, not just in CPS, but CPS is not exempt, we spend millions of dollars on professional learning. And what we have found through research is that when professional learning is disconnected from content and instructional materials, then we don't get the return on investment in terms of improving academic, out academic outcomes for students. I want to break down each of those four challenges with data uh, based on our district as well as national surveys. So the first one, we ask the basic question of all of the teachers that have been surveyed, um, a little over 540 teachers surveyed. We ask the question, does your school currently have curriculum in the area that you teach? And nearly half stated no, that they do not have high quality curriculum in that area. I want to call out, because the way the survey was done electronically, we weren't able to disaggregate this, but as we were taking the survey, we had focus groups across all sectors of the city. And I watched as the returns came in. We started on the south and the west side. And I will tell you that if we were able to disaggregate the survey results, you would see that this red uh, no would increase significantly, close to 60% when you look at those schools that are heavily populated with our black and brown students. There in terms, uh, there we see the inequity issue when it comes to curriculum. Speaking to looking at the data from Chicago, when teachers and students don't have access to rigorous standards and curriculum, there's a long-term impact. So here you're looking at a study that was done through the new teacher uh, project that was released in 2018, cited in the opportunity myth. And what it shows is the impact of students not having access to grade appropriate and rigorous content when they in post-secondary. So here what you're looking at is the data that shows that when students are not prepared because they haven't accessed rigorous content, when they go into college, 40% of students take at least one remedial class in college. 1.5 billion, uh, billion is spent annually on remedial courses for students going into college when they're not prepared. One in four students spend an average of $3,000 extra to earn their degree. And I think the most sobering fact is that first time bachelor degree seeking students taking a remedial class are 74% more likely to drop out. The second challenge is around time. And so I wanna share both uh, research data from a national perspective, as well as uh, the, the data that we've collected from our very own teachers right here in Chicago. 
from a national standpoint, um, Rand Corporation reported that teachers report spending seven or more hours per week or 250 hours per year developing or selecting instructional materials. And so teachers were asked nationally what percent of instructional materials did they say they typically create or find. And there you see the data that um, comes out to be about seven hours uh, per week. So we asked that same question for our teachers here in Chicago of the, the teachers surveyed from the focus groups. We stated, how much time do you spend searching for instructional resources per week? And you're going to see from this graph that 75% of our teachers are stating that they're spending anywhere from two to seven hours. And in this question, you'll note, it's just for searching for curriculum. That doesn't include the time that they have to spend then planning once they find um, resources. It doubles once you include the planning time. So that's, that's the challenge on time for CPS. The third challenge that I identified uh, as a need for the, the curriculum equity initiative is around quality. So from that same RAND Corporation report, elementary teachers were surveyed about where are they getting their resources and materials and curriculum from. And you'll see here that from that national study, 94% of teachers reported that they're going to Google, 87% to Pinterest, 79% to Teachers Pay Teachers, and 39% to Engage New York. And I have to note that of the four um, online spaces where teachers are looking for material, the lowest uh, selection was Engage New York, but that's the only um, source that's actually vetted for quality. So we took that same um, issue of quality to our teachers here in our survey, and we asked our teachers where are, their where are they finding their resources um, for curriculum. And what you see here is, is comparable data to the national study, that our teachers are also going to Google. They're also going to Teachers Pay Teachers. And we also listed all of the other places that they state that they're going from YouTube to Twitter to Pinterest. Um, some are creating their own. And when this happens, <coughs> there's no way for them to know um, or it hasn't been vetted for quality for the resources that they're, that they're finding. So on top of the fact that they're spending the time, they're not always finding the kinds of material that is really going to challenge our students and provide them with the great appropriate content um, based on Common Core Standards that is preparing students to be successful, not just in their elementary and high school years, but in post-secondary. Additionally, on the challenge of quality, when you look at uh, the na another national report, Teachers were asked to rank their top five funding priorities. And you'll see here that high quality instructional materials and textbooks tied, look, actually tied for first place next to additional high quality staff. And, and I would want to po point out here that high quality instruction, the need for high quality instructional resources also ranked even higher than teacher salaries. So this is um, showing that this is something that teachers are really demanding. Another important fact, only 18% of teachers nationwide strongly agree that their materials are actually aligned to standards. And so when you look at uh, professional development, which is the, la the final, the fourth and final challenge that I out outlined, the disconnect with professional learning. And I shared um, earlier in the presentation the research that Elmore shared around trans forming the core, and professional learning fits um, into that space. Professional learning just simply cannot live up to the potential unless it's rooted in content that teachers teach in their classroom. And this is a study that was released from the Aspen Institute in 2017. So here you're seeing that the research is saying that relevant um, professional learning has to focus on um, the instructional materials to reflect the full aspiration of college and career readiness. So all four of those challenges that I have presented to you we found uh, research and data from both a national perspective as well as right here in our very own district that shows the need for, for the Curriculum Equity Initiative. So what exactly is the Curriculum Equity Initiative? Here is an excerpt that was placed within the RFP so that we wanted to make it clear what our expectation is here. We are not asking for off-the-shelf material that some schools may already have by way of textbooks. What we're saying is that we want a curriculum that's designed for Chicago public schools, that's inclusive of assessments, that's free from bias, fair across race, religion, ethnicity, and gender, and culturally relevant. 
with a mindful integration of diverse communities, cultures, histories, and contributions. So that's including attention to our African American students, Latinx, Asian, indigenous people, women, LGBTQ, religious minorities, including Muslims, and working class people and youth. And we put this in the RFP because we wanted to make it clear that this is a, cr a curriculum that's customized for Chicago because we really believe that the diversity, the rich diversity and history that's found within our student population should be represented in the classroom. When our students engage in the classroom with curriculum, they should see themselves as well as the world around them to develop a sense of identity, agency, and authority. And we believe that this is the right next step in order to meet our next edge of growth for continued academic progress. So what's included in the curriculum? Here is everything that is included in the curriculum suite. Oftentimes when you hear cur curriculum and even in um, many of the presentations that we've done across the city, I have personally engaged principal groups across the city, across all of the um, networks, and we've also engaged teachers across all sectors of the city. And you get when you ask the question about what is curriculum, and Dr. Jackson even did focus groups across the city as well um, with our leaders, you get mixed returns in terms of what curriculum is. And sometimes individuals think that curriculum is just the textbooks. The textbook is a component of the curriculum. So when people ask, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that you're not buying textbooks anymore? That's not what that means. What it means is that we want to make sure that we have a full comprehensive suite of curriculum that provides our teachers with everything they need as professionals to meet the needs of our students, which is inclusive of the textbook. But the textbook alone does not represent all that curriculum has to offer in our classroom. So what is it? We're looking at the scope and sequence of the Common Core Essay Standards that shows the sequence of learning and the cycles um, in which standards build upon one another and progress throughout the years at the grade levels. Units of study, lessons for teachers as well as digital student facing lessons where students have an opportunity um, to work at their own place in addition to what teachers are providing in terms of lessons in the classroom. Many lessons you heard Dr. Jackson talk about um, our diverse learners, our EL population, um, SEL, making sure that there are modifications there. One of the biggest things we heard from teachers is needing support around developing different lessons that are modified and so there will be many lessons and learning activities to meet the needs of that uh, for modification for diverse learners and EL learners as well. There will be curriculum maps included, unit overviews, unit plans, teacher facilitation guides as well as instructional routines, access to formative and summative assessments, and an opportunity for teachers to build their own um, assessments along the way through an item bank. We're covering the areas, the content areas of English language arts, mathematics, science, social science, and world language. In world language, it will include both Spanish and French. And I do want to acknowledge that in Chicago Public Schools, we have identified the arts as, core con as a core content area. And so um, coming after this phase, we will be um, going through a procurement process for the arts. The curriculum release will be, it will start January 2020 with the first release of curriculum and go through cycles until we have a fully aligned suite of curriculum with a target date of July 2021. Um, the units will be released in alignment with the scope and sequence. So even when we release in January, those units that are released in January will be within the sequence of learning for a specified grade level so that teachers would be able to use right away. And we're also going to have a library of individual standards aligned digital resources that will be available in September simply because we recognize that we can't provide a quality custom curriculum by September because it will take time to start the build. But we want, because we, we looked at the survey and said, what, what is it that we can do right now? And so what uh, a library of resources, will, digital resources will be available to students uh, and teachers based on the fact that we had so many teachers weigh in that they don't have access to anything right now. So that's that'll be available in September, but as far as the fully designed curriculum, the first release will be in January of uh, 2020. Annual cost estimation. In the first three years, the annual target cost is $45 million for years one, two, and three. What comes within that? Um, there are contract categories that cover curriculum development, professional learning, because I talked about the need for triangulating the professional learning within the space of curriculum and making, two the, making sure those two are working in tandem. So professional learning, project management is going to be needed for a project uh, initiative like this. Licensing, so we talked about it being digital and fully interoperable so that students have access to um, the digital aspects that we have to pay for licensing. Translation, 
was critically important for us, and then support and maintenance. By year four, five, and six, the cost uh, reduces significantly. And I will say to this to you in terms of the annual cost estimate, just in keeping in mind, we're the third largest district in the nation. We have over 360,000 students. So when you break this 45 million down across 360,000 uh, students across five different content areas, you're essentially looking at about 10 to $13 per student per content area as the target. Um, to close, before I go into questions, I just want to add a personal aspect to this. Um, both Dr. Jackson and I have been um, network chief officers, and in that role, I also served as a deputy uh, chief officer. Um, and I would say combined between deputy and network uh, officer chief, I have supervised over 70 schools across this city. Um, and I think we both, when we sit down and have these conversations, we talk about the personal aspect of this. I can't tell you the pain that I feel when I walk into a classroom and look at a learning activity that is not grade appropriate, it's not rigorous, it's not standards aligned in one classroom and can go to just a few blocks down the street or to another side of town and see students with a totally different experience and recognize that when that inequity exists, oftentimes it's happening in, our, in schools that are populated with black and brown students. That cannot continue. And while there is no one panacea to solve the achievement gap that exists, whether it be Chicago or nationally, we know fundamentally that it, we is, it, it is no way that we continue to know that there is a need for access to excellence in terms of curriculum and not meet that need. This is a critically important next step in realizing the goals of our five-year vision to ensure that equity truly is a moral imperative in this district if we believe that every single student, regardless of their zip code, regardless of their race, regardless of their country of origin, that they can realize the CPS vision of college, career, um, and civic life. Success in those areas, and it starts right now with the Curriculum Equity Initiative. Thank you, Chief McDade. Board members? Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to say this is an important step um, <clears throat> to make these curricul this curriculum available to teachers across the board. I think the proof is going to be in how we roll it out. Yes. Training, accessibility of technological resources at schools. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? And it sounds like it's going to be phased out a little bit. Can you just give us the, the quick thumbnail yes. on that? Yes. So it will be phased out. Um, and I, I do want to acknowledge for the board, uh, kind of just recognize that this was not a few months or six months in the making. This has been two years. Um, we spent, uh, the first year, we spent a lot of time just in discovery and how to do this well and looking at other districts and what they've done and trying to um, create something like this and this actually puts Chicago Public Schools kind of at the forefront as trailblazers we also know that other districts smaller districts that could could not get publishing companies to look at an RFP like this because they don't have the scale um, this will benefit um, students nationally and so in that process we really looked at what has happened in other districts some of the pain points one of them being you know training as you discussed in terms of professional learning and what we're what we have planned is that we've already launched um, a pilot of schools that are preparing and gearing up for this process. I know that Dr. Jackson talked about the curriculum collaborative where our very own teachers and administrators and content specialists will be working um, to look at the quality of what's being put out and we we have partnered with Ed Reports to build uh, quality rubrics for that as well. So there's a lot that has been in place. You mentioned um, talking about technolo technological tools and infrastructure. As a district we have um, become a member of IMS Global to ensure that we have interoperable uh, high standards for technology interoperability. So that was one of the first steps that we took even before we started to embark upon an RFP process, um, making sure that teachers have a one-stop, a, a single sign-on solution where we don't have the problem 
love all of the different sign-ons for teachers and students. That was one. Um, the, the modernization project where um, this past year we invested $50 million in terms of um, looking at technological infrastructure in schools as well as devices. And what we did was we did an analysis to determine which were the highest need schools in preparation for something like this. And we made that um, investment up front so that when this is released, we, would, we address those schools that may have some of the challenges that you just outlined. Additionally, the preparation in terms of professional learning has already begun, and we have a requirement within the RFP that the providers also incorporate professional development, but that alone we know is not enough. So we have our pilot schools that we've launched that have already been engaging in professional learning around how to utilize digital curriculum resources and how to create the kind of classroom that I described earlier in transforming the core around student ownership. So those wheels are already in motion, and the, they'll be kind of like what I call our first reader so that they can help us work out the kinks before it does a full launch and cycles of professional learning at, at scale in the district. I, I, it sounds great. I, I think the part that I just want to make sure that the, the board is looped in is if you need more resources to do those things, make sure that the board is aware so that um, they can look yes, at how to do. make sure. Yes, right, <laughs> sure. Yes, we do. Yeah. We, we, we absolutely will um, need support. And, and some of the things that you talked about in, uh, in terms of just the project management that you saw is listed in there, um, making sure that as a district, even when we uh, get past the first three years of build, that the sustainability yep. is there in terms of the, the individuals that will be able to The success will come yes. from, the, from the successful rollout. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. uh, board members, any other questions? Comments? Uh, just one. I noted that you used uh, data analytics uh, provided by the RAND Corporation. Uh, you know, that's an organization that I'm affiliated with. Um, I uh, think that um, if we are going to appreciate best practices nationally uh, uh, in education, uh, having that kind of information available to us, that didn't tell us what we didn't know, but it confirmed uh, that we, too, have a similar issue when it comes to the consistency of our curriculum and then what's been taught in you know, schools across our, our district. Uh, so you know, I, I strongly encourage that we continue to, to use that kind of data and have those kinds of, kinds of relationships because I think it, it, it gives us a, a broader perspective. President Clark, if I could say one, Chief McDade, and, and we've talked. I'm I'm just reiterating something that I that I've already expressed. The most of the evidence so far on electronic um, internet delivered curriculum has shown that where it's successful, it tends to work almost the opposite of of what our goal is. That it's it precisely in schools and to students who are already pretty advanced they benefit the most from taking advantage of these distance learning curricula so we definitely um, but that's part of the execution I think is to to really pay attention to whether the the stated equity goal is compatible or mm -hmm. how, how to make it compatible and I would just encourage you not to go too overboard on the customization, the requirement mm -hmm. that the providers customize it just for Chicago. If you have evidence that there are things that work for for schools that are more at risk and they are off the shelf, that's better than a customized thing that, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, that comment and that feedback. I do want to just clarify, when we say customized for Chicago, we're stating that because of the fact that this isn't something that exists in its current state in terms of cultural relevance and free from bias, but recognizing that none of the uh, vendors will be providing, uh, will be starting from scratch. So we're, we looked at the quality of what they already provide, and they actually would be customizing what they already have to ensure that it aligns, one, with the Common Core standards, and then addresses our need for diversity and so when we say Chicago this is actually something that um, once completed could be used nationally and it's, it wouldn't be something that's just for Chicago as long as a district um, is using common core state standards so Chicago is basically putting the brand that this is something that our district saw the need for in terms of rather than just taking what's available on the shelf 
So they're not starting from ground zero or from scratch. They are taking material that is already uh, readily available that is quality, but customizing that to ensure that it's aligned to the standards we've adopted, which is Common Core, and then making sure that level of cultural relevance is there. So that's what we mean when we say customizing it to Chicago, because no other district has asked uh, any um, curriculum developer to actually do that. Mm -hmm. that's a good one. Let me ask one question. Um, one question, well, actually two. Uh, is all of this curriculum going to be delivered technologically? So it, they will be able to deliver, uh, to access it through our student information system, but they, teachers will have the flexibility to be able to pr pr uh, print as needed. Okay, and the other question is, um, when I heard the presentation, um, you went to all the constituents, except I didn't hear, did we talk to students? So we do have a student, we do have student group, um, groups set up in terms of getting feedback, but they did not complete the, the surveys that we, that we sent out. Okay. The educators completed the surveys. Okay, I would suggest survey or not that they be included. Too many times we create things that don't include the people we serve. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, especially with that great student board. You yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments, concerns? Thank you, Chief McDade. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we have two more short presentations. Um, first, I'd like to invite Tony Howard, our Executive Director of Access and Enrollment, um, to the podium to discuss the revised pre-K enrollment process for the Early Childhood Program at Oscar Mayer Elementary School. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. In the spirit of equity, I'm here to present today um, some recommendations that we propose making at Oscar Mayer Elementary School. Today's presentation will co consist of a brief um, overview of background information, the findings and recommendations made by the Office of the Inspector General, the community engagement process, the proposal, and the proposed timeline. Mm -hmm. By way of background, um, on April 17th of last year, the Office of the Inspector General conducted a, com a performance review of Oscar Mayer Magnet School's pre-K admissions process and, an, and issued board report number 08-0326-EX5. Based on the performance review, the report makes several key findings and recommendations regarding Oscar Mayer's school type as well as the admissions process. By on um, the recommendations as far as Oscar Mayer school type. In 2007, CPS applied for a magnet schools assistance program grant and indicated that Meyer would be a citywide magnet school. What this meant was that at the time we applied for the grant, um, we indicated that Meyer would draw students from the entire um, city of Chicago and that all students throughout the city would have an equal opportunity at um, being admitted into Meyer. Despite the MSAP grant application, the following year in 2008, we converted Meyer into a magnet school with an attendance boundary instead of a citywide magnet program. So that, what, that's, what that meant is that in 2008, um, despite the application, we decided to imp implement a, a, an attendance boundary at Meyer so that students who reside in the attendance boundary would be selected before students who, outside, who resided outside of the attendance boundary. At the request of um, former President Rufus Williams, additional language was added to the um, board report um, for CPS to conduct and, and file an annual demographics assessment of Meyer with the board secretary before September 1st. In the 10 years since the magnet school conversion with an, um, with an attendance boundary, no annual, annual demographics um, assessment had, had ever been filed with the board secretary. In the 10 years since Meyer has been converted into a magnet school with an attendance boundary, the racial and social economic com composition has become much less diver diverse. Meyer's student population has shifted from a predominantly African American student population to a predominantly white population from um, one of the most affluent areas in the city. In regards to the preschool um, process at Oscar Meyer, as a magnet school with an attendance area, Meyer is the only elementary school um, in the city to um, give attendance area children priority in receiving two years of free Montessori pre-K. Meyer draws from the most affluent attendance area in the city. 
The pre-K program at Meyer provides families with free Montessori education. This Montessori education is equivalent to about $30,000 um, in the private sector and costs CPS families approximately $700,000 each year. <coughs> Despite this investment, some Oscar Meyer pre-K students later leave CPS for private schooling and or re relocating to the suburbs. So what we found out is that after receiving this $30,000 um, education in pre-K for free, um, a little more than 25% of students over the um, past few years have left Oscar Mayer um, for either private schools or um, relocating to the suburbs, usually in about first grade. Because of the high demand for, from attendance area students, students residing outside of Meyer's attendance boundary have very little, if any, chance of ever being an offer, offered a seat in the free Montessori pre-K program. So based on these findings, the Office of the Inspector General um, gave the following recommendations. As far as pre preschool, they recommended that CPS should discontinue funding a free two-year pre-K program at Oscar Meyer that uses an admissions process skewed to favor the children in Meyer's attendance area, the most affluent in CPS. Regard, in regards to the magnet school, CPS, it recommended that CPS, the board, and the Meyer community should consider other options, including converting Meyer into a citywide pre-K or a K through eight program. After receiving the, the OIG's recommendations last April in the fall, we embarked on a um, thorough community engagement process with the Oscar Meyer community. Meyer Elementary School's LSC established a 36-member working group consisting of parents, teachers, and the school community. CPS engaged the working community in two community meetings with over 80 attendees and two working group sessions, each with over 30 attendees. The, Me the Meyer working group and community met a total of 10 times. There were three community forums and seven working group meetings. As a result of um, the community engagement process, we proposed the following in regard to the magnet school program, and then I'll talk about the um, preschool recommendations next. In regards to um, maintaining Oscar Meyer as a magnet school program, um, to address the diversity concerns, we recommend that the current building utilization be evaluated to identify additional space, to identify if additional space exists to offer K through eight classroom seats to out of boundary students in, level, in tiers one, two, and three beginning this fall. And then more immediately, we propose the following changes to the pre-K program for the upcoming school year 2019-2020 the pre-k the current pre-k student or pre-k three students who are now in the building will be grandfathered into the pre-k four program for the upcoming school year and they will not um there will be no charge so they will be um offered a free pre-k four program for students who are currently pre-k three students however as far as the pre-k three program for the upcoming school year we're um, proposing to make that a tuition-based pre-k three program for the fall of 2019. So then as far as the fall of um, 2020, 2021 is concerned, um, to maintain the four-year-old pre-K program at Oscar Meyer, the program would be tuition-based, and then the tuition-based pre-K three program would be phased out and no longer offered. And then the following year, 2021-22, um, the City of Chicago's goal is to have the universal pre-K pre four program available in the Lincoln Park area. If that happens, then the pre-K four program at Oscar Meyer would be um, free of charge because it um, will be um, universal pre-K four program. And if that does not happen, then the tuition-based pre-K four program will continue until such time that universal pre-K, um, the universal pre-K four program is in the Lincoln Park area. Thank you, and I'm open for questions. I just have one. I think I know the answer to it, but I'll go ahead and ask anyway so you can say it. You know, nobody's happy that you end up, we end up in a situation like this where we get embarrassed with the intentions to do one thing and then the execution was different. Do you think any other situation exists in any other, in any other school across the, the network where we had intentions and applications to deliver one set of services and we did it differently? Where we could end up, I mean, in a situation similar to this where we're trying to 
serve a diverse set of kids, and we end up serving a very, very narrow group of kids, which, of course, knocks out some of the intentions. So do you have any other things we have to fix like this <laughs> that you're aware of? Um, we, we certainly can conduct an analysis of um, things like that. I'm not aware of, of um, any other circumstances um, such as, as this one where, you know, students are receiving a, a free $30,000 um, education from the most affluent area in the city. I just want to add really quickly, Board Member Furlong, that um, one of the what was really problematic about the Oscar Mayer situation is that all of the other Montessori, the, the focus is Montessori, um, the offering of Montessori. The other Montessori programs uh, have a citywide um, boundary or lack of boundaries, I, I should say, and they draw from citywide. In this case, um, the neighborhood component, the boundary for the neighborhood is what caused this to, to occur. And as the neighborhood continued to change in terms of um, um, of affluence, it created this problem. So it was twofold, but mainly it was the Montessori piece that created the issue. And we, we have a limited number of schools that are Montessori, so w that's what makes this so unique. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Just the following on Chief McDates. It was easier to do this than to just change it so that it wasn't a boundary-based uh, mm. school? Um, yes, because in, in the community of um, Oscar Mayer, which is Lincoln Park, many of the schools that surround Oscar Mayer are um, overutilized. So th to, put, um, to put a citywide boundary, to just say make it citywide, um, means that we would have to then draw boundaries for all of the students that would be in Oscar Mayer's um, neighborhood to other schools and many of those other schools that offer a similar um, uh, quality of education in terms of the school's rating are overutilized and there would be no space. So, so that's a longer term situation if we wanted to go citywide there that we would have to account for and try to fix. But when we look at our numbers, that wasn't something that we could do right now with the limited amount of space um, for student seats. Understood. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Dr. Jackson. Yes. Oh, you have another presenter? I do. Did you want to? Yeah, we're one? running about an hour behind. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Well, Cami, you heard that. Um, <laughs> this is real quick. Um, our uh, Title IX officer, Cami Pratt, as well as Christina Jordan, our Executive Direc Director of HR and Talent Management, will present a quick update on the district's comprehensive non-discrimination and anti-harassment and retaliation policy. Well, good afternoon, President Clark, board members, our honorary student board members, Dr. Jackson, Chief of State, and the public. Uh, this is our uh, comprehensive non-discrimination, harassment, and retaliation policy. So we're proposing updates to it. So some, for some background, the current policy was adopted in May 25th, 2016. It predates the Office of Student Protections in Title IX, as well as predating the Office for Civil Rights Systemic Investigations. It's also based on rescinded Obama-era Title IX guidance and does not address all forms of complaints of discrimination. Key substantive changes. Our current policy does not define critical terms. It's less inclusive than our CPS values. So the revised policy defines discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and protected categories. It goes beyond the federal law to include sexual orientation, immigration status, domestic partner status, and gender identity, perception, and expression. And then the procedural changes. Our current policy includes procedures for reporting, responding to discrimination of complaints, and right now that leads one to report to the Equal Opportunity Compliance Office. Um, and who is currently responsible for addressing all forms of discrimination covered by the policy. The revised policy will clearly direct students, staff, and parents to the office that actually handles the issue. So the Office of Student Protections, the Office of Inspector General, or the Equal Opportunity and Compliance Office. The revised policy also allows for responsible departments to publish procedural manuals which will detail information and processes for addressing discrimination complaints. 
So over the next few months and before the start of the school year, uh, in preparation for the policy release, we will be doing training for staff. Uh, this summer we'll be training the central office staff as well as network chiefs and principals. And then teachers and our remaining staff will receive web-based online training before the start of the school year. In addition to the training, we'll also be doing a number of web updates. So the CPS website as well as the Equal Opportunity uh, Compliance Office, uh, Law and Talent um, and other websites will need to be updated updated with the new policy as well as the new non-discrimination statement as well as uh, CPS's contracts and other documentation where it's listed. In addition to that, we'll also be doing a compliance poster. So uh, similar to the Protecting Chicago Children initiative, that compliance poster will be sent out to all schools and will be placed up in prominent areas, both in the school building and across our office locations. And then there also will be a procedural poster that will give uh, individuals instructions about what are the proper offices and procedural steps to follow should they need to uh, issue any um, complaints or any issues to the particular office that they should be reaching out to for um, assistance. And then uh, the, the policy will take effect um, ideally at the beginning of the next school year to also give us the ability to update our procedural manuals across our offices um, to ensure that they provide the proper steps for um, staff and other individuals to take in order to receive the services that they'll need under the policy. Thank you. Board members, questions? Questions? I'll, I'll just make a general comment. Obviously, this is very thoughtful, well laid out. Um, and I'm sure it will be done very well. Uh, at the end of the day, it's obviously this is a massive training undertaking. The real question is the quality of the training uh, and the fact that it's done in a way that at the end of it, everyone sort of has the same basic information and knows what they're doing. That's quite a challenge. A lot of it calls for uh, change management. Uh, just for a moment, uh, talk about uh, uh, how you see that part of it taking place, how we make this training effective. So the uh, the uh, three offices we mentioned have been working together collectively, one across the content, and I think to ensure that we're uh, meeting all the educational information that we need students, to, uh, sorry, to staff and students and, and principals and other individuals to know. Um, we also have uh, working on uh, procuring a training vendor, so that should be finalized this month. Um, and it'll give us the ability to actually move the training into a web platform to make it mobile friendly, to make it accessible in multiple languages, and also to give people the ability to be able to take quizzes and test their understanding as they're taking the training um, and it also give us the opportunity to be able to uh, set schedule timelines to do follow-ups and if we see that there are issues around understanding to do additional um, supplementary trainings and courses to be able to uh, fill in that information as needed. We'll also have metrics um, that we'll be able to track across the district um, in a way that we currently don't have across the training. Thank you very much. Thank you President Clark. That concludes the CEO's report. Okay, since there are no other questions, I have just the one basic announcement I make at every board meeting. Uh, I will continue to encourage everyone to use our, uh, our website to contact the board in between meetings. Uh, that website is cpsboe.org, uh, and it's a way for you to have time with the board, with board members and have your issues addressed, uh, uh, I believe, in a very timely fashion. Thank you very much. Madam Secretary, please share the details for the next board meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. The next board meeting will be on, held on Wednesday, June 26, 2019 at the CPS Loop Office. Advanced registration will open up at 10.30 a.m. on Monday, June 24, 2019, and will close on Tuesday, June 25, 2019 at 5 p.m. or until all slots are filled, whichever is first. If anyone has any questions about this process, please contact the board office for our assistance. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to proceed with public participation? Yes, sir. I'll then, proceed. Madam Secretary, please share the rules for public participation, emphasizing, of course, the time allotment. Yes, sir. Um, speakers, please listen while I provide directions for public participation. I will call your name and number when it is your turn to speak. When you hear your name, please immediately proceed to the staging area to the left of the podium and check in with our board office staff member, Eric. Uh, he will line... Um, he will be line, line you up in the right order. When it's your turn to speak, proceed to the podium and state your name. After you state your name, I will then start the two-minute clock, which is visible to all in the audience. And I would also like to note that there is a timer on top of the podium for the speakers to see. Uh, when there are 30 seconds remaining, the color will turn yellow. And when the two minutes are up, the light will turn to red. Please immediately take your seat. When your time is up, to allow for the... 
when your time is up to allow for the next speaker to begin. Also, for anyone who plans to stand in support of a speaker, please be aware that the only walkway in the boardroom is behind the podium. Therefore, if you would kindly make a single file line and stand as near um, as the railing as possible, this will still allow people to pass through the area safely. Thank you, Mr. President. And before I actually begin, Mr. President, with the um, speakers list, um, I would like to call up a few individuals. Um, we have the Reverend Jesse Jackson with us this morning, um, president of the Rainbow Push Coalition. He will be followed by um, Michael Brunson, the CTU Recording Secretary, please. Good morning. I'd like to make an Today is Dr. Jackson's birthday. What? Some, somebody said happy birthday to her. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I told everybody in this building. Secondly, I want to express my profound thanks to Sister Dr. McDade for her report today. I want to add the dimension I think is often missing. We focus from boardroom to classroom, and not bedroom to classroom. At the end of the day, uh, there must be a renewed focus from REM to STEM. Uh, we watched uh, Demi uh, Semyon play Bridgeport two years ago in the, in the game at Chicago State. The one by 20 points. Well, I wonder why. Effort. Crisis and effort. Uh, I'm sorry, a crisis and effort. Uh, I, I go to Simeon or Harper or, or Nicoa Valley, as the case may be, as how many days a week do you practice basketball? They say six. How many hours a day? Three hours a day. In the radio, in practice? Of course not. In TV? Of course not. Look me like I'm silly. Uh, when you get tired, you sit down and no, we, 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 we keep running. I submit to you there is a crisis in effort that must not be denied. There is a, a commitment we must, in addition to structural changes that you make, the money invested, the, uh, uh, if we can get 100,000 parents to do six things, take your child to school, meet your child's teacher, exchange home numbers, Turn off the TV three hours a night, pick up reports because every nine weeks, and take your child to church, jump to the synagogue once a week. There's a bottom up dimension that I think will round out your program, Dr. Dr. McDade. Last time, I want to say this. I went to United Airlines, Shell was meeting today, uh, before, just before my time is up. And the headquarters of United Airlines is in Chicago. I said, there's not a flight training school in our schools or city colleges in Chicago. The, 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 the plane mechanics make more than, than principals make. Just uh, uh, hooking in with, say, United Airlines and our school system would be a big deal. And last year, as a matter of civics, uh, I mentioned to you, Mr. Clark, 20,000 high school seniors will graduate this May and June. One, if every high school student has a diploma in one hand, a voter card in the other, 20,000 new voters. Now, for whom they vote is their business. It's not... not but the fact that you have a sense of, of civic consciousness should be as much part of the curriculum as, as, as saying, saying, uh, saluting the flag. And I say 20,000 a year, would be, we, we could be number one in America, and that would bring our children to this generation of political activity. Uh, thank you very much, friends. Thank you, Reverend Jackson. As always, your words were thoughtful and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And our next speaker, please, Michael Brunson. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing today? It's a long meeting. Okay, uh, this might be one of the last times that I speak to you. I, I'm going to let you know right now, I'm retiring at the end of this uh, fiscal year. So please indulge me. Um, I just wanted to, before I get into the main topic here, I just wanted to um, uh, bring to your attention a few things that are going on here. You know, there's going to be a, a big rally going on today, this afternoon at about uh, 5 o'clock down here at the um, Thompson Center at 100 West Randolph. And um, you're going to be hearing a lot about uh, what we are looking for. You know, as you know, we have been uh, 
negotiating with you ever since the beginning of the year. And uh, a lot of our members, and I'm not going to speak to it right now because we're going to hear enough about it, but we have shortage, shortages in uh, special education and noncompliance with the law. I'm sure you're going to hear about that. We have problems in bilingual. That's not being adequately taken care of. You might, you're going to hear a little, little bit about that. No counselors in summer school. And... Um, you know, we're going to be talking about critical shortages and staffing, and I'm going to give you a flyer here so you can know. I'm, I'm inviting all of you to come to the rally today, but in case you don't make it, just go, go buy a flyer here. By the way, on the way that I was on the way in here, I noticed that you had a table here with Aspen uh, doing signups or whatever. I, I just wanted to mention that we took a, a poll of our members, a somewhat of a survey, and a few things came out from what our members had to say because they have to deal with it in the schools. Um, they, they're complaining about that it doesn't have the functionality that they need. The parents and counselors cannot see their missing assignments. Uh, it takes too many steps to complete the task. And uh, they just feel like it's not as efficient as it's been made out to be. Now, I'm just telling you, that's from the poll that we take, took, and I think you should uh, take that to mind. I listened to our new mayor's uh, speech the other day, and it was really something. Um, I'm looking forward to us taking a turn here and I'm looking forward to us really taking seriously this new principle of equity that I'm hearing about over and over and over. I really liked about the part that she talked about uh, the four stars, how she uh, reinterpreted them. The first one being public safety. Let me say one thing that I think about public safety. If you want to cut down on the violence in this city, you got, we got to make sure that we employ as many people as possible and we got to prepare them. And that's going to lead me to my uh, second thing. She said the second star that she was referring to had to do with education. Now, I, you're going to hear a lot about education here. But um, I have to say this, and before I preface, uh, say this, I want to preface it by saying that I, myself, I have uh, two master's degrees. It's nothing that I brag about. I, I, you know, I used to be called a professional student. So I just want to say that before I say, everybody's not going to go to college, okay? Everybody's not meant to go to college. Everybody should not have to go to college. We talk a lot about college and careers. We don't do enough to prepare for the careers. Now, I've been in office for nine years now. And ever since I've been in office, it's been a, for me, it's been a personal battle for, uh, to, to keep, uh, stop the diminishment of vocational education in our schools. We used to call them shop classes. Now we call them career and technical education. But there's a real problem here because we have seen a steady diminishment of those kept classes within our schools now. With our last contract, we put something into place to slow that down. And, and, I, and I have to say, I want to commend the group that I'm working with um, as far as our uh, joint committee on CTE. We have been making some progress, but there's some more that needs to be made, and that's why I want to bring something up here. It goes back to the part about uh, jobs. I want to make sure that everyone is familiar, and I'm sure you should be, with the project labor agreement that states that um, each union shall establish a goal of at least 30% of its apprenticeships, interns, and other constructed related opportunities annually will be composed of persons who graduated from Chicago public schools. You know, I, I don't feel as though this is being tracked the way it is, and I want to leave this for um, uh, Chief McDade. I have a copy of the Progress Labor Agreement, uh, the Malta Agreement, the Supplemental Agreement, and some of the apprenticeships that have been uh, done to uh, fulfill that. And I just want to say that we don't have to reinvent the wheel on a lot of these things. We just need to do what we said we were going to do. This project labor, labor agreement has been in place since the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, if we work towards making sure that it is fulfilled 
And I, m myself and my committee that works with CTE is more than happy to work with you in any way that we can do that. This is going to be extremely important as far as preparing all of our students for a uh, successful career. So I just want, I needed to bring that up. And um, I know we're short on time, so I'm not gonna take a lot of time. I just wanted to um, end with a little bit of poetry since you're used to hearing that. <laughs> um, and it pretty much sums up where I am right now and where I, what I plan to do next. And it's something, um, basically it comes from Robert Frost. He wrote this over 100 years ago, a walk in the woods in the evening or something like that. And I'll have to say this. These woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. This is not the last you will see of me. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll proceed with the speakers list, and I will call one of our principals first. She's speaker number 24, please. Holly Dacris, followed by speaker number one, Lee Stein. We then have speaker 31, Dorothy Barrett, and speaker 42, John Carnuth, followed by speaker number two, Sylvester Walters. Well, it's good afternoon at this time. Um, I really just wanted to come before the board and I have some people in the room to thank, and you really deserve to hear this because there are amazing people out there doing great work. Um, my name is Holly Dakers, and I'm the proud principal um, at Rudolph Learning Center and also a proud CPS parent. It's hard to believe that just over a year ago, I stood in front of you asking for a new building um, setting for my students. Um, so when school opened in September, we had a new address of 1628. West Washington, so thank you. Since September, we have been approved, um, have a plan in place as we begin a grade level expansion over the next three years, making Rudolph a specialty school pre-K to eight. Um, and we serve students throughout the city with severe and profound disabilities. So history making for CPS. Um, I want you to know I stand before you with gratitude um, thinking about what I was going to say today, I looked at a placard on my desk and it said girl boss, which is very interesting. Um, so today I th say thank you to all my girl bosses who helped me continue to shape Rudolph, um, which is an amazing school to educate students in. Um, my AP and I often joke about who's going to be the Janice and the Latanya in a particular conversation. <laughs> I'm usually Janice. <laughs> uh, I say that because as a female leader, I'm surrounded by greatness. To Dr. Jackson and Chief McDade, thank you for all you do. You pushed me to never settle and have taught me to never make a decision in fear. Thank you for your servant leadership. To Dr. Keenan, um, you will be missed. Thank you for all you have done for our diverse learners and always taking the time out for our schools. To my chief, who is amazing, she makes it easier to be a principal. She's supportive, responsive, and intelligent. To Cheryl Nevins, I think you're in here somewhere. Thank you for the driving force, the late night calls, and being my confidant. Thank you to my girl bosses and senior leaderships. Today you lead a district, and tomorrow our students lead the world. So thank you, and happy birthday. Thank you, Ms. Tuckers. <laughs> Please state your name. Uh, Lee Stein. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lee Stein, and I'm here as the chairperson of the Shures, Shures High School LSC, and I'm also a Shures parent. Um, two months ago, we came here with 11 other people to this board meeting um, with a list of issues needing resolution. One was the insurance that our field would be completed by April 28th. Two, to request a, and uh, to assign a third permanent full-time engineer to our school as well as additional custodial staff. Three, a request to provide us with a complete assessment of the capital improvements that our nationally registered landmark building so desperately needs. And four, a request for a timeline for the promised abatement of our counseling offices. There has been some progress since our uh, March visit, and we thank you for that. Uh, we have received our third engineer, but we still have only nine custodial staff for a building of 500,000 square feet. 
We are told that the auditorium, library, and second floor gymnasium walls will be tuck-pointed, flat sections of the roof of the library and auditorium repaired, and the counseling office abated, but have been given no timeline for the work. While we are grateful that our building is finally getting some attention, we cannot plan for our summer programming unless we know exactly what's happening and when. It's May 22nd, and the complete building assessment promised in March has still not been made available to us. Surely this assessment must be finished by now, or on what basis would CPS have identified the areas of the building in need of the most immediate attention? Our athletic field is still unfinished and won't be completed until sometime in July, which is almost 10 months after the breaking of the ground. I strongly encourage, we strongly encourage CPS to continue its scrutiny of the construction company and take its business elsewhere. Our requests now are as follows. One, a copy of the long-awaited complete building assessment so we know the scope of the work ahead of us. Ms. Stein. Uh, two, a timeline for the work scheduled for this summer. Three, an additional custodial staff to ensure the health and well-being of our students and staff. And four, additional environmental test, a surface mold test by a different provider. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Their next speaker, Mr. President, 31, Dorothy Barrett, please. Good morning. My name is Dee Barrett, proud Belding Elementary parent and proud school parent and community liaison for Schurz High School. I've had the opportunity over the last several months to have many conversations with students across all of our programs. I've learned much about how our students feel and have been able to solicit suggestions for ways to improve the way we do things as a school and improve the quality of life for our students and staff. I've discussed a number of things with students this year, painting hallways, installing personal hygiene dispensers and bathrooms, filtered drinking fountains, etc. Last week I was speaking with a colleague about the great ideas that the students had discussed with me when she interrupted me to say that we already had filtered water fountains in boxes in a closet in room 219. In December of 2017, students wrote a donor's choose grant for five filtered water drinking fountain filling stations and filters. You'll find the grant information in your folders. They designed a survey for students and staff to help identify which drinking fountain saw the most activity, and when the research phase was complete, they worked with engineering staff to identify the most appropriate locations. The grant was funded in February of 2018. Fountains and filters were purchased, and now they sit in a closet because our engineer was informed by Aramark that he was not to install them. And I'm sad to say with all the other issues plaguing a building of this size and age, the filtered fountains fell off the radar. Last week, Friday, May 17th, Evie Rafante, community LSC rep, spoke with Aramark District Manager Casey Decker by phone. Documentation of her follow-up email is in your folder. Mr. Decker indicated that this was the first he was hearing about these fountains and that they would be installed over the summer. Aramark Operations Manager Tracy Collins indicated via email Friday that she would have our engineer reach out to a vendor to schedule the installation. Yesterday morning, however, she emailed to say that it is a CPS policy not to install water fountains due to issues with mildew. If there is such a policy, it seems to be applied very selectively. One post to the Raise Your Hand for Illinois Public Education Facebook page tells me otherwise. In only a few hours, I collected a list of 26 CPS elementary and high schools with filtered water fountains. All but two of the students involved in writing this grant graduated last year. We would like for the students graduating this year to enjoy the fruits of their labors before they graduate. Please help us make it happen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Mr. Carnuth, if you just give me one minute before you begin, let me call the next speakers, please. Um, we need speaker number two, Sylvester Waters, for last call. We then have speaker number three, Natasha Carlson, speaker nine, Catherine Osgood, 15, Lauren Trost, 16, Emily Penn, 23, Stacy Smith, and 50, Joan Lipschutz. Thank you. Please proceed. My name is John Carnuth. I'm a friend of Shure's board member and a graduate of Shure's from 1982. In 1978, I decided to join the Shure's football team. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a field to practice on. Forty years later, we're still waiting for that field. Um, but there are other problems with the school, and as you've already heard, um, we need some attention on this. On March 20th, 2019, we came in front of the board to shine a light, a spotlight on environmental issues negatively impacting the health of our staff at our school. While we appreciate all the, uh, that our appearance on the meeting, along with letters of testimony from several counselors working in the office in question, prompted an inspection of the several areas of concern on Wednesday, April 10th, we are puzzled by the need to immediately relocate the individuals situated in this office the following day. That was Thursday, April 11th. According to the limited indoor air quality survey report provided to us, 
all air readings collected during the survey were within acceptable ranges as defined by the ASHRAE and the IDPH for indoor air quality. It seems strange that a seemingly benign report would warrant such an immediate evacuation of the counseling office. Equally as strange is that of the five indoor spaces tested, there were no rooms with readings that were higher than those in the room slated for abatement. So why are those rooms not being included in the summer abatement project? Also troubling is that there are some inconsistencies in the report. On page five, you will find there is different school listed in the heading. You also see in the additional screenshot that the Word file itself is named Good Samaritan Mold Survey CCU Pod 3 Report 32816. How are you to be sure this report this is even our report? This data is clearly compromised. As the health and safety of our staff is paramount, we request that additional environmental tests be done by a different provider and that the test conducted be of the highest detail, including a surface test for mold and not simply a visual inspection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kearney. Our next speaker, please, Sylvester Walters. My name is Sylvester Walters. My wife and I uh, currently have children that attend Callis Maria Charter School, both which are in kindergarten, that, that they are about to uh, graduate next month, actually. We also support Callis Maria Charter School because I believe that uh, education is important to me because it gives our community and children a place where they can grow develop, uh, learn, and acquire skills in order f for them to achieve and succeed in life. And also, I like the most important thing and what I love about Calis Maria Charter, Charter School is that it feels like family. I attend meetings, schools, activities, and just recently, me and my daughter, we uh, just did our first daddy and daughter dance uh, last month, <laughs> which uh, she will very remember for many years to come. Thank you. And again, Board, I thank you for allowing me this opportunity to get before you guys and share my experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Our next speaker, please. Good afternoon, unelected Board of Education. My name is Natasha Carlson, a special education teacher for the last nine years, and what feels like my part-time job of advocating for my students, because I feel that consistently and systematically, CPS continues to deny the rights of our students with disabilities, which has been outlined in the public inquiry process, this same board that claimed they started the public inquiry process, when in reality, it was on November 16th, 2017 in which this board also denied Sarah Karp's expose and we knew that there was truth because we had been coming here for months prior also including December 7th of 2016 in which it was the same day there was a special education presentation as that was just at the height of this crisis and it has continued until this day in which we are demanding that CPS actual make movement at the bargaining table to ensure that our students with disabilities have their law followed and their rights upheld because as educators we have no other recourse except for a grievance procedure at this time because apparently it does not matter enough to CPS that a public inquiry an investigation of the federal law found CPS in systematic delay or denial because of their policies and procedures that were made behind closed doors made behind with not special education experts or advocates not including the stakeholders and was made based on the root of money and we are about to spend hundred and eighty million dollars I believe on this new curriculum which do not get me wrong I need curriculum as a special education teacher but I'm a special education teacher throwing in modifications occurring at the end is not appropriate and we will no longer allow us to be like a latter thought in not only your instructional choices but as well as our contract negotiations we will stand up and use whatever Avenue possible to ensure that CPS follows the corrective action report guided by the authority of Thank the ESB, you. and we will ensure that we will be ready to strike with our sisters and brothers and sisters and SEIU Thank you, Ms. to defend our students with disabilities, which is all of your jobs. Our next speaker, please. <laughs> speaker 9, Catherine Osgood. 
Good afternoon, board, Dr. Jackson. Um, my name is Katie Osgood. I am a, the co-chair of the CTU Special Ed Committee. I'm a member of the CTU bargaining team, and I'm also a proud special education teacher in the district. Um, I want to highlight some of our bargaining demands that really do speak to um, our special education students' needs out there in the buildings. We are really excited about the potential for change through these demands. As uh, my sister uh, Natasha just said, that um, we're recovering from a massive scandal around special education and the lack of services and um, denying them. They're, um, they're right, um, but there's still a lot to do to fix those wrongs. CPS needs to address the severe special education teacher shortages. Shortages that are created not because there aren't enough qualified candidates, but because our working conditions are so appalling um, that people won't stay in the work. Teachers, staff, and students report feeling unsafe due to crisis level understaffing and building level chaos caused by years of disinvestment and budget cuts. Um, we don't have anywhere near suf sufficient substitute coverage, and our special education teachers and uh, support staff are being pulled to um, sub instead of giving our students the services they need. Our, our students are missing services as a result. We do not have time to collaborate with our colleagues, including clinicians and paraprofessionals, um, which is why we're demanding to bring back the 30-minute prep period at the beginning of the day for elementary and middle school. This is a vital time, and it's the only time where we all can get together and we don't have children in front of us. Um, we also need to guarantee that IEP team members are, are free to make the student-centered decisions unhindered from interference from networks and um, other administrators. Um, our, our teachers and our staff are overwhelmed, but perhaps more than any other, our members who have taken on case management duties are drowning. Um, we need a dedicated case manager in every single building. Right now, that work is tacked on to um, other people's, um, to other jobs, like special education teacher or counselor, or sometimes even the APs or principals. Um, that needs to be a, a dedicated special job allocated by good. Central Eight. Um, Thank you. Thank you, and I just also, as a bargaining team member, um, we are going to be doing some open bargaining sessions where the CTU will invite all of our members to come and observe, and Dr. Jackson, I would like to personally invite you to one of these sessions so you can hear the session and hear the demands and hear what our members have to say Thank about you, what is um, going on in the schools. Our next speaker, please, Speaker 15, Lauren Trost. Good afternoon. My name is Lauren Trost. I'm a parent and PTA president at Blaine Elementary School. Blaine Elementary School supports 112 students with IEPs with currently three more students that are pending. 15 of these are um, language based and we have 69 students with 504s additionally. Blaine also serves between 50 to 70 students residing in the Madonna House, which serves families affected by homelessness, and the House of the Good Shepherd, which serves women and children affected by domestic violence. Most, if not all, of those students from those houses experience some form of trauma, which directly impacts students' ability to learn. These students require additional social and emotional support. Currently, Blaine has one counselor, per the board policy, and a social worker for two and a half days per week. The number of students with IEPs and 504s requires our counselor at Blaine to operate as a full-time special education case manager rather than a counselor. Ha the half-time social worker spends almost all of her time delivering direct service minutes to students based on requirements outlined by their IEPs. Thus, the current level of management to ensure compliance with special, e special education laws, meetings, and support required for the Blaine special education caseload leaves virtually no availability for counseling and social and emotional support for the other 725 students, including the students that have faced domestic violence and homelessness. By the, um, the National Association of Social Work recommends a ratio of one to 250 general education students or one to 50 at-risk intensive students ratio. By this math, Blaine should have four to five social workers. We are requesting our social worker be made at least full-time to begin to scratch the surface of our need. Additionally, last week there was a social media threat um, made against the Blaine students. <laughs> Sorry. Um, some parents chose to keep their kids home from school. Um, there was increased security presence and people were scared. Ms. Trust, can you please conclude? Yes. If we, um, if we had the support that we needed for this former student that was making threats, 
and we had identified it early enough, we could get the interventions that he needed and the support that he needed. If we had anywhere near the adequate resources to address the social and emotional needs of our students, the former student would be getting the help he needs rather than becoming another kid in a system that we are failing. Thank you, Ms. Trust. Would someone be able to address the letter that we sent today for us? Could we talk to someone now about the request? Who's, uh, who's, who's the next speaker? The next speaker is Emily Penn, please. please. Number 16. The letter that we sent last week. Whoever Excuse me, she's speaker. not a, a speaker. speaker. Okay. That's not oh, Emily Penn. Speaker. Emily Penn, please, 16. That would be a no then? No one can help us address the Next letter speaker, please. Our next speaker, please. Emily Penn. That would be no. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Emily Penn. I'm... I swear, Dr. McDade, I don't always cry. <laughs> um, I am proud to be a school social worker that provides interventions to some of our most vulnerable students uh, with disabilities. Over the last 12 years working for this district, I've learned a lot of things. But one important thing is that my conditions are my students' conditions. And just as my students come to me for help today, I'm coming to you for help. Help me provide my students with a designated confidential social workspace so that our students never have to tell me about their trauma of abuse or community violence in a hallway, their school anxiety in a stairwell, or the bullying that they've experienced while a school staff, me staff member is sitting nearby because the social work space is a shared space. We would never ask ourselves to share our hurts or our traumas in front of other people. Why do we ask it of our students? When I hear a school described as underutilized, I shudder knowing those are our spaces where I can get privacy with my students and where the special education teacher provides necessary sensory breaks. Designated confidential clinician workspace is a contract demand. Help me provide school staff um, valuable consultation to meet the social emotional needs of students while in their classroom. We need the 30 minute prep periods before school to do that. This is a contract demand. Help me meet the demands of federal and state laws by having a dedicated case manager that can effectively manage IEPs. Give me a special ed caseload of no more than 50 so I can evaluate students for SPED, provide supports to their teachers and parents, and really do interventions as they're meant to be given. These are contract demands. Help me and my fellow clinicians not feel like we can't do this anymore without damaging ourselves and our families. Please, people leave and don't want to work in CPS, not because of the kids, we love them, but because of the working conditions, and we need these contract demands to Ms. help Penn, the kids. Thank you. Our next speaker, please, 23, Stacy Smith. Good afternoon, I'm Stacy Smith. I am a case manager and also a LBS teacher. I have a case load, or I have a case loads up to 90 students. Um, I provided the board members with a handout, which is handout A, and this is an example of a case manager schedule who is teaching as well. So if you look at the schedule, you see most of it is predominantly for teaching. Uh, also handout B, which is the rules and responsibilities for the case managers. Um, there's over m more than 20 bullet points, and I can easily add 20 more per case manager duties. So I asked, where would I get the time to do a full-time case load for case management if I'm teaching? Uh, do students with disabilities deserve dedication or part-time? Definition of dedicated, exclusively allocated, single-minded loyalty devoted to one task or purpose part-time, involving or working less than customary standard. Do I consider myself dedicated teacher and a case, case manager? Yes, but in reality, per the aforementioned definition, I'm part-time. Because if you look at handout B, roles and responsibilities of a case manager, it is a full-time job. And according to handout A, so is teaching. So I say it again, case management is a full-time job. It is very difficult to balance two jobs effectively without some sort of breach of fidelity. Mm -hmm. So I would like the board members to please take a look at handout C. And this is, consists of a survey by over 100 of our CTU members. Uh, it speaks about non-dedicated case manager concerns and our proposed solutions. <clears throat> uh, 
I personally Ms. do not Smith. want to be working less than customary standard. Our students deserve more. Overall, we need to show dedication per our uh, SPED issues and concerns and provide dedicated case managers in every building. Our children deserve dedication. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And their last speaker, Mr. President, is speaker number 50, please, Joan um, Lipschutz. Um, good morning. Before I start, I left my regular glasses in the car, so I am not trying to look cool or anything. I just need them. Um, my name's Joan Lipschutz. I'm very proud to be here. I'm a certified school nurse. I'm very proud to be a certified school nurse. And I only got two minutes, so I will get down to it. You can't teach a sick child. I'm a healer. As a nurse, I support our kids, not our kids, your kids and my kids, your kids and my kids, to understand and function and thrive within their medical limitations. I teach the school community how to keep students safe and educate them appropriately. I work with parents to find resources, access is adequate, to access adequate health care. I improve attendance, test scores, and academic outcomes based on many, many studies that are unquestioned. And yes, yeah, sometimes I put a Band-Aid on a boo-boo too. Um, sorry. Um, I used, I am tired. I am so tired. I'm even thinking of retiring early because I used to think it was me. If I could just manage my time, if I just get a good Excel sheet, if I just find that magic bullet, I can get these kids. But you know what? It's not me. It's us. It's Chicago Public Schools. You know, um, you put me in a position that, as a C, I have 4,520 general education students under my care. That's 1.29% of the school's population CPS. And based on the National Association of School Nurses, there should be six of me. I have 249 students with disabilities on my nursing caseload. Um, I do get support from my nursing supervisors in the Office of Diverse Learners, and I want to acknowledge that they've, they've done some things to improve, but there's been a long lack of, there's been benign neglect up until last year or so. We need a nurse in every school, and I need a caseload that I can actually be a good nurse, become better part of my community in the school, and really take care of my kids. And I cannot do that now, and I cannot tell you how frustrating it is and how frustrated I feel every single day trying Ms. to do a good job with a difficult situation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lipschultz. The next speakers, Mr. President, will be speaker number four, please. Is Joseph this on a Gase. different subject? That's, this is a different, okay. yes. Uh, board members, any comments or questions on what you've heard? Well, <clears throat> let me ask one, Dr. Keenan. And we usually go through this in September and October where we hear an influx of issues. How do you, um, how do you take, put into context what was just shared with us? Well, we're in negotiations right now. And so a lot of these concerns are being brought up during the negotiations. And um, these are all things that the CTU has talked about with us in terms of concerns that they want to feel like they, that should be placed in the contract and going forward. Thank you. Um, I'll just make one general comment to all of those that just spoke. Uh, from a personal pers perspective, um, my wife is, uh, was a special education teacher for decades and actually retired from CPS as a school psychologist. Much of what you've talked about I've heard for years. Um, I am absolutely convinced that under Dr. Jackson's leadership uh, and Chief McDade and others uh, that uh, no one is ignoring this, uh, but I hear uh, the, what's behind your words is the reality that you want to do a good job and you really don't, uh, in some cases, have all that you need. Uh, there's, there's no lack of understanding there. So um, we're not saying much now because part of this is contract negotiations, but your, your, your issues are genuinely being heard. Thank you very much. Let's proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. The next speaker then will be speaker number four, please, Joseph Pace. We will uh, then have speaker number five, Regina Fobbs. Moving on to speaker number six, Leticia Rocha. Um, then we have speaker 19, Karen Armstead uh, Longstead, uh, followed by speaker 26, Idalia Caracols. Um, do we have Joseph Pace, speaker number four, last call? Moving on to speaker five, Regina Fobbs, last call. We'll proceed with speaker number six, please, Leticia Rocha. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leticia Rocha. I am a Mexican. I live in the southwest side of the city in Gage Park since 1999. I am a single mother of two. Alfonso is a student at Prescott College Prep, and Idali is a student at Mansueto High School. Both are part of the Noble Network. I attended Kelly High School and graduated from a public school. Since my children are in Noble schools, they have always emphasized communications with parents. Also, I, ha I have access to information about their classes through PowerSchool. I prefer they send me a text message or call me to let me know when my student did something good at school or when there was a problem. As a mother, I am entrusting the school with my children and I expect them to communicate with, my every, with me every step of the way. I want to share a bit of advice with you, which is considering parents a priority and looking for ways parents can keep up with the education of their children. Parents must work as a team with the teachers of the schools to ensure the progress, the progress of our students. This work cannot be done without communication. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rocha. And their next speaker, please, uh, Karen Armstead Longstreet. Um, first, I want to say happy birthday. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Armstead. I'm the mother of five children. Three of them have graduated from DRW College Prep, a noble school. One of them is currently a junior at DRW, and my last one is looking forward to being a student at DRW. The staff at DRW are on the same page as I'm on when it comes to the future of my children, and together we're a team. There is no one that will let my children quit, and all of us believe that they can succeed. A few examples of the support I've seen from DRW, I just want to mention. After the loss of my mom and dad, Mr. A, who is the office manager, encouraged my daughter to continue to go forward and that life doesn't stop just because we lose a loved one. It's just another chapter, is what he said. Yes, it hurts, but it gives us an opportunity to go on. Ms. Mullane, the DRW parent liaison, keeps me up on everything that's happening at Noble, and she makes sure I have spaces to be involved. Her love for children just overflows. She cares about me and all of the parents at DRW, and it spills in every conversation and every invitation, and it makes me feel so lucky and blessed to have a person such as her on my team. When my first son graduated from DRW, he had a trunk party, and a lot of the staff members showed up. It showed him that when he walked across the stage, he walked into a long partnership, and it was not just him graduating, that he developed lifelong team members. And to this very day, I'm still connected with those staff members, and they continue to support me and my children, talking to them about college and life advice. On Monday, our mayor, Ms. Lightfoot, said that your business is my business. And that's so true when it comes to the education of our children here in Chicago. Sometimes you hear kids say, oh, it's none of your business, but it is, their, it is our business. Ms. Longstreet, can you please conclude? Yes. Um, I just want to say um, thank you for allowing me to share my story, and um, I appreciate everyone on the board. I don't know you personally, but I appreciate being here and hearing all the stories of everyone. So thank you, and you all have a wonderful day. Thank, thank you, Ms. Longstreet. Good afternoon. My name is Idalia Corcoles. I am from the West... Elsa neighborhood. I have two daughters at St. Bruno Elementary, one who will start UIC College Prep next year. My son is a current junior there, and my eldest graduated from UIC College Prep with a full scholarship to the U of I in Urbana-Champaign. With three children now there, we are a fire cat family through and through. My daughter is a junior at the U of I in Urbana-Champaign. Her sophomore year at UIC College Prep, she had a daughter, and UIC College Prep made sure that she got all the support she needed to finish her education and didn't make her feel any less for being a young mother. My mother and I insisted she go off to school. We told her we would take care of her baby. These years have been very difficult for her, being away from her daughter. There have been many times when she has felt she cannot continue and thought about quitting. 
I remember the first time the alumni counselors visited her on campus and she said she felt so much support that they made her feel that she that this wasn't impossible for her to achieve. They were Latinos just like her and supported her with filling out FAFSA and finding tutors if she needed. They have encouraged her to stick with it and have made it her most avid supporters. I thank, him, I thank them for my child's persistence in college. She is now double majoring in psychology and Spanish and minoring in Latino Latina studies, will graduate next year, 2020. She still goes back to visit UICCP every time she is in Chicago, and she has a great relationship with her teachers. At UICCP, teachers are more like lifelong friends and have offered to help her with essays and giving her their emails and personal phone numbers so she can reach out if she needs help at all. We need more schools with supports like alumni support coordinators, Noble Schools offer. All schools should have the funding they need to care for their students and support them to and through college. To our new mayor, Ms. Lightfoot, Ms. please Perkins. focus on making all of, our, all of these supports available throughout CPS schools, not just Noble. Find the funding necessary to support our students obtain a college education with the support they need. Sending them to college, college is not enough, but having the support to see them through. Thanks to the discipline and dedication of these teachers, my children look forward to continuing their education. Noble cares about my children's education and makes sure my child's needs are met. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. President. The next group of speakers will be speaker number seven, please. Uh, Nancy Curran, followed by speaker 33, Kizzy Young, 48, Denny Mayer, 57, Marion um, Bimani, and then we have speaker 59, Kim Saunders. Nancy, please. Nancy Curran, speaker number seven. Thank you. Oh, good morning, happy birthday. Um, yeah. I, I, and my mother of a diverse learner too. So I just really have to concur with that group over there. It's terrible. Please say your name is Karen. Nancy Curran. Is that what you asked me? Yes. Okay, um, and my comments actually, um, notwithstanding that, is the, um, uh, regarding my diverse learner is the CPS legal department. Um, we as our uh, concerned parents, we don't understand why the CPS legal department continually attempts to sidestep the law. Um, because of the disregard for the law and the blatant disregard for ethics, our group of concerned parents has had to contact outside agencies to either investigate the CPS legal department or compel the CPS legal department to do their jobs. For instance, our group has made our case to the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission, and that commission opened up investigation to five CPS attorneys. Uh, there, these right here, right I have right here, are three different letters from the Attorney General that I just got yesterday, and what they're doing is they're demanding CPS legal to follow the law. Um, many of us, this group and many other parents, has also had to file a FERPA violation with the federal government because laws are being disregarded. Um, our group has met with many aldermen and they're all very concerned that CPS legal plays fast and loose with laws and their parent constituents. Um, we've continually had to go to outside sources to manage CPS and the CPS legal department. Um, the aldermen, particularly the ones that sit on the education committee, do not think this is sustainable. Parents couldn't agree more. When laws are disregarded, all you're doing is enabling bad CPS actors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tren. Our next speaker, please, Kizzy Young. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kizzy Young. Um, one of the reasons why I'm here, because I was a local school council member at um, Jenner, odd emerge. Um, I just want to say like a year and a half ago, I thought that was a good idea. Come to find out that it's not. It had failed Jenner students horribly. Um, mainly my daughter, she's in seventh grade. I recall the robotic, robotic class of Ogden stood in, for, in front of you and they were, um, you know, excited about the program that their children was involved. However, my daughter and some of the 
Jenner students was not. I don't understand why my daughter wasn't a part of that program. She should have been up here a part of that program as well. Children at Jenner has not been informed about many programs that can exceed their education as well. Um, I was falsely removed from the, um, well, Ill illegally removed from the local school council because I didn't agree with a lot of the rules and regulations that they instilled regarding Ogden. I was for Jenner. I stated that from day one. I wanted to make sure that every student that answered Jenner was treated fairly and properly, and it has not. The merge of Jenner and Ogden has failed. The parents of the former Cabrini Green, and I'm hoping that we can get some assistance. Um, you have the principal, the assistant principal is calling the police on children. They're getting children expelled. And these are the, this is the voice that I voice regarding treating our children properly, mainly African American from Jenner. Um, they're getting expelled. They're not a part of this Robertic program that they were bragging about. Why is that? Um, we're being, we, we're being, um, um, excluded from a lot of programs, mainly African Americans, um, regard what well, gender, low income, say low income um, programs, I'm, we're not being informed. Ms. Young, thank you for your okay, comments. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker, please. Speaker 48, Denny Mayer, please. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Denny Mayer. Uh, in April 2016, uh, former Ogden. Uh, Principal Michael Byer breached my family's information to parents in an effort to coordinate an retaliation against me. Rebecca Wells, Sierra Conley, and LSC member Thea Kachoris Flores all received personal and identifying information about my family. Thea should have reported the breach at the time to a CPS official. Chip Johnson was the network chief at the time and clearly not managing Mr. Byer. This was not one of Mr. Byer's uh, careless data breaches, but a purposeful targeted violation. I recently discovered the violation myself through a FOIA request. CPS was unaware of this breach despite an Ogden LSC member being on the email and releasing it through FOIA. I have never met this LSC member, but she joined in in attacks on my character. The FOIA office has also potentially covered up C CPS's own malfeasance with respect to Chip Johnson. In my communications with Jeff Dace and Randall Josserand of Network 15, they have lied to me and become non-responsive. Uh, Gabby Brizuela has also not answered. I ask for the following actions, an investigation into Chip Johnson's role in this violation, a more thorough investigation into how many other breaches exist against my family, an investigation into the FOIA office for their failure to report the FERPA violation and for their redactions, which look to cover up bad behavior by CPS officials. The removal of Thea Kachoris Flores from the LSC for her behavior and failure, failure to report this targeted breach as she has gotten away with a clear ethics violation. One of the parents, Rebecca Wells, has used this information she knows about me to engage in a verbal attack on me at a public CPS meeting where she also physically attacked a teacher. LSC official Deb Land, whom I have also never met, engaged in a derogatory comments about me to a CTU official this year. To me, this indicates that the breached information is still being shared and used to retaliate against me. There are people in this community who have shown propensity for engaging in retaliatory Mr. Mayor. and now have personal information about me. What is the process for a parent who has a reasonable complaint about a principal and a network chief? How do we get a network chief or higher official investigated for their behavior? Why won't the law department respond to my reasonable request? Mr. Mayor, thank you for your comments. Our next speaker, please. 48, Denny Mayer. That was Denny, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, Miriam Bimani. Yeah, you're last. Sorry. Do you need me to say my name? Please, so you could start. Miriam Bimani. Thank you. Four years ago, parents and the LSC at Ogden asked the board for help. Diverse learners were being taught in a closet at the school. At the time, parents and the LSC met with Deputy Chief of Staff, Kara Kranz, and two board members. The issue was remedied immediately. Kids were moved the next day out of the closet and into a classroom. Fast forward to now, the parent who advocated for her son asked for records related to that advocacy under FERPA. She was told by the principal, quote, the school respectfully disagrees with your characterization of the room as a closet, end quote. That made us wonder why fight the designation of the space? What is going on now? 
We hoped the school wouldn't be using it as a teaching space once again. Kara Kranz, who was the deputy chief of staff who helped parents before with this issue, is now the current assistant principal. She would know that kids shouldn't be taught in the storage room. When looking at the architect's plans, it is clearly labeled as storage room. In cross-checking with the CPS building assessment summary, the space is listed as a storeroom. It's 125 square feet, concrete walls, no windows, no egress, no ventilation. We need the board's help again. The school is using this storage space as a classroom, and we need your help to get kids into a more appropriate setting. From my understanding, at least half of the 125 square feet is actually used for storage. The other half has desks crammed in it. It is also my understanding that sometimes as many as 12 kids are pulled out for services to that space. Even if this space were safe to be occupied, 12 is too many. One kid per 20 square feet would max this to five kids and the teacher. Half that for half the available space in the closet. Because the administration indicated that the space is not a closet, parents were directed to call the Fire Prevention Bureau and 311. Please help us get the kids out of the storage room. It's not an appropriate place for children. Also, please make it clear to administration across Mr. the city Money. that we expect our children to be taught in appropriate spaces and not to put kids in closets. Thank you. Thank you. Their last speaker, Mr. President, is Speaker 59, please, Kim Saunders. Okay, happy birthday, Ms. Jackson. Uh, my name is Kimberly Saunders Dale. I am from the city of Chicago. I represent the whole city. Uh, I am a st constituent from the old town near North area. I am an original Ogden African American parent. Can you please direct me to the CPS conflict and resolution department? I am a parent of four children, ages 20 and 14, a disabled boy who has epilepsy, ODD, ADHD, a girl who has a neurological development disorder that no one has been able to diagnose. I have not been able to get any help. All my children were students at Ogden International until I was made aware of that both my children IEPs were very sing similar. Going further, I began to reach out um, to the current acting principal Bancroft when she initially hit the door and asked her to assist me begging pleading due to the administration not being responsible with my children's diverse educational I removed them from Ogden I placed my daughter at Lincoln Park and my son asked to be homeschooled due to him being exposed to too many traumatic events at Ogden because of the merger he has now been diagnosed with PTSD in which he is afraid to go to Seward Park because of what went on reaching out to Chief Jocelyn and demanding he helped me send my child to any school in CPS at this point. He threw him at Alcott, going above and beyond. The people at Alcott have been trying to give my child an IEP due to the fact that Ogden has stated that they cannot find any of my child's medical records, which I have extensive paperwork from Lori's, DePaul, and also Illumasonic. Now, my two youngest children are still at Ogden, but was being bullied, and because the principal has some type of racial motivation against me, I have been banned. I cannot go up to the school and watch my children. They are afraid at times, and I don't know what to tell them because I don't want to be the ignorant person and let my children know how messy teachers and staff are. I'm letting my children still have the faith, my two younger ones that has no issues, to still have faith in CPS. I have been covering a mask due to all of these things. I don't know, I don't know, Sanders. I don't want to change my two kids' schools. I just want help for Ogden and Jenner. I have faith still in the school. Thank you, Ms. Saunders. Ernie, I assume you, you made some notes on the classroom issue. And Jadine, I know that you would look into any of the bullying concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll continue. Uh, we have speaker number. I'm sorry. And yes. The IEP issue. We'll look into that. Yeah, our um, parent involvement specialist will connect with those parents. Okay. Thank you. Uh, continuing, we'll uh, proceed with speaker number eight, please. Uh, Cheryl Connor. We then have speaker number 10, Aaron Young. 32, Marissa um, Seidler. Um, speaker number 11, Nakia Terry. And speaker number 43, Araceli Aregun. Ms. Connor? Cheryl Connor. Uh, I'm a parent of two children at Saban Elementary. We have um, some handouts for you that include a letter from uh, the state rep, Ms. Ramirez, and also some background and some photos. 
Sabin has um, a broken, unsafe playground and has had it for years. The parents have been actively working on getting it replaced for years. Efforts to do so include communications with more than 14 different CPS employees, meeting with the aldermen to secure funding, as well as fundraising to have a nonprofit come install the playground. And this was thwarted by the new CPS volunteer requirements. Finally, last summer, uh, our principal received a letter from CPS saying that we were budgeted for a new playground in fiscal year 2019. The old unsafe playground was torn down by CPS last September, and initially we were told the new playground would be built this spring, then in June, then in August, and now they're saying maybe October. Meanwhile, three blocks away, Pritzker got $700,000 from CPS last October for a new playground. This money was allocated despite the fact that Pritzker already has a safe, functioning playground for their students, and their build is starting in two weeks. There are children at Sabin in the third grade who have never been able to play on a playground at their school because of how unsafe it is. Every single day, children are injured from playing on barren asphalt lots. One child had to be hospitalized after suffering a mild traumatic brain injury from playing on an empty concrete lot. Sabin parents, students, and staff have had enough of this unequal treatment by CPS. More than 1,300 of us have signed a petition to try to get CPS to address this funding in inequity and put in the playground that you guys promised. CPS has been unable to provide answers as to why Pritzker is getting a new playground when Sabin is not. There's absolutely no transparency about how decisions about prioritization of capital improvements are made. This is a pattern by CPS that allows wealthier, whiter schools to get special treatment. This is what institutional racism looks like. The children at Sabin deserve a new playground, and the people of Chicago deserve answers about this inequality within CPS. Thank you, Ms. Kenner. Our next speaker, please, speaker number 10, Aaron Young. Good afternoon, my name is Erin Young. I'm a 15-year veteran special education teacher for the Chicago Public Schools, and for the last decade, I've worked in our low incidence cluster program, servicing our students with the most significant disabilities. Our students come to us bust from their home school because they require a significantly modified curriculum. What does this mean? They need a simpler curriculum with a focus on life, schools, life skills. This means that they are getting a very restrictive setting, in some sense, the most restrictive setting outside of a separate placement. Over the last five to six years, I've seen a disturbing loss of the continuum of services for special ed in Chicago public schools. We have lost self-contained classrooms and some schools have removed all pull-out services altogether. What does this mean for our cluster program? We have seen a trend where students whose IQ scores um, qualify them as mildly cognitively impaired or students with autism who have IQ scores that are higher but also have intense sensory needs are being forced into the cluster program. I'd like to refer to you to the document that I provided which is the Illinois State Board of Education's Dynamic Learning Maps Alternate Assessment Participation Guide and you'll see the highlighted portion typically associated with an IQ of 55 or below to help distinguish between students who have cognitive disabilities and significant cognitive disabilities from the students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. This means that many students with cognitive disabilities will not qualify for the DLM. But because we have lost self-contained classrooms, we are having students forced into the cluster, into a more restrictive setting, into a less um, challenging curriculum because they cannot get serviced in a classroom of 35 or 40 students and that is not appropriate and that is not okay and for years advocates educators parents have come before this board to highlight issues of inequality in special education and the board has denied these and we know now through the is be open inquiry process that we have been violating the law and under this I'm standing here begging you, we are going to end Ms. up Young. under federal investigation because we are putting too many students on the dynamic learning maps because we are not providing instruction in their home school. So Thank please, you for your comments, before we Ms. get Young. another black eye. Our next speaker, please. 32, Marisa Sadler. Hello, good morning. I'm Marissa Seidler. I've been teaching special education for 15 years almost 10 years in middle school cluster here in Chicago. I serve the students with the most significant disabilities. I'm here today to speak for my students because they cannot speak for themselves. The transition to middle school means that there are hormone changes and we are looking at larger and stronger bodies. 
When you're working with middle school students with significant behavioral and sensory needs without trained staff and appropriate facilities, it is dangerous for both students and staff. At my school, me as well as one other staff member are the only people at the school trained in safety cares. We only have the first day of that safety cares training and our training is now lapsed because it only lasts for two years. We have no sensory facility and no crisis team. Incidents of violence towards staff as well as students as well as elopement attempts have occurred at my school. I've had students tell me they feel unsafe in the classroom due to the behavior of another student. Even our students with the most significant behavior and sensory needs deserve to have their crises managed with dignity and in a safe, supportive environment. In our current cluster environments, we can't do that. We don't have the support or the facilities or the trained staff to do it. It's unconscionable that a district the size of Chicago Public Schools does not have the programming to meet the needs of these students with significant behavioral and sensory needs. We need these programs in our schools. We need more BCBAs to support these types of programs, as well as teachers in the cluster and inclusion programs who are working with these students every day. Thank you, Ms. Seidler. Thank you. That's the last speaker, Mr. President. That was their last speaker. I'll continue with the speakers list. Thank you. Um, speaker number 11, please, Nakia Terry, followed by speaker 43, Araceli Aragon. Nakia Terry, last call. Last call for Araceli Aragon. Moving on to speaker 13, please, Jennifer Biggs, followed by speaker 14, Nicholas Wozniak. Speaker 17, Gabriel Paez. Speaker 35, Alejandra Santillan, 20, Tiffany Walters, and 21, Melissa Ramirez Cooper. Jennifer Biggs, please. Hello, Jenny Biggs, CPS Mom of Three, raise your hand. Table the vote on the 135 million for contracts with various vendors for curriculum. $135 million is a major investment, more than $260,000 per school, $450 per student, four times more than the $32 million in new academic programming announced with great fanfare just two months ago. You have a new boss, and our Education Transition Committee made a bunch of recommendations just last week. One suggestion found on um, underneath, uh, I don't have the page number, sorry. Um, implement racial equity impact assessments for important policy decisions. We feel this $135 million expenditure certainly qualifies for such an assessment. Equity was the common thread in the Education Transition Committee discussions and has been mentioned often by CPS as well. This contract states that the outcome will result in equitable access to curriculum. Yes, teachers should have equitable access to curriculum materials, but this contract screams kids on screens, test prep, and it costs $135 million. Um, instead, teachers and students should have access to culturally relevant research-based curriculum that is designed for student-teacher interaction. In addition, we all know there is an incredibly urgent need for special ed supports and services, social workers, nurses, facilities maintenance and investment, as well as student safety and respect. Without this curriculum, it doesn't matter. It is irresponsible of you to move forward with this approval of this contract today. Please table it. We also have a lot of other questions. I'll try to get through them. Um, in, you did say that in the RFP you called for a culturally relevant curriculum. Where is this in the contract as a guarantee? I don't see that in the agenda. Uh, research does support culturally relevant curriculum. What is in the agenda says ed tech. Uh, what does digital curriculum, digital lessons, and modern Ms. student Ms. assessment analytics platform mean? Yes. Um, we don't know what that means. How much of this $135 million curriculum will be on screens? What was the involvement of teachers in developing this plan? Were any students involved or LSEs consulted on what this will look like on the ground? Is this just test prep under a different name? And Thank how you, will you Biggs. hold your vendors accountable? Thank you. Thank you.
My name is Nick Wozniak. I'm a SICA at Suter Montessori and a steward with SIU 73. And uh, I work with one-on-one -on -one with a special needs student, and I don't like missing school. Um, as SICAs, I think we're the second home for a lot of the, the um, students at CPS that have the most needs. Uh, I think we're the relationship day in and day out that's the stability that they need to succeed and grow. Um, and SEIU members of bus aides, parent workers, um, security officers, we're the backbone of, uh, in CPS that allows the school to function every day. But I felt like I had to, to come here today because of the utter and register the utter disrespect that this board has shown SEIU members for many years. Um, the, and the disregard for the students that we spend every day with, as has been attested to here very well. Uh, we're understaffed severely, making our schools unsafe and unclean. And we use Sodexo and Aramark, which are terrible managers. Um, our members live in poverty work with special needs students, the highest need, and we live in poverty because this board has taken away every raise over the, since the Great Recession, um, and we're still getting paid on par for, from decades ago. Uh, we need to be focused on our students at work, and unfortunately, um, I don't think uh, that, the board, that, the, um, that we're not supported by the board in that. Our principals tell us to our face, they shrug and say, we don't have to follow the law. We don't have to, to follow the contract, and we can pull you from your students. We can make you teach classes, um, and we have, no, we have no answer to the subbing crisis that we experience in our schools. Um, we are given no appropriate training for what we do, even though we spend perhaps the most time as SICAs with, with special needs students, students with trauma, of any employee in CPS. Um, I hope the board will change their approach in the nearly year of bargaining to our proposals. Um, I would invite Dr. Jackson to our open bargaining meeting on June 4th. Um, but at the same time, um, I speak to you as a socialist, and I am a member of Social Alternative, and I know that justice doesn't come from the top, from a, a board that is more accountable Mr. to big business and the billionaires than students that we serve. And I, uh, SCI will be ready to act if the board is, is not. And I Thank uh, you, Mr. express Rosanne. solidarity with CTU and the community members here for education for all. Thank you. Our next speakers, please. 17, Gabriel Paez, followed by 35, Alejandra Santillan. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Paez. I've been working at Brian Piccolo School of, School of Excellence for the last six years, four of which is a bilingual uh, coordinator, ELPT. Today I'm here, along with parents from my school, to petition you, the Board of Education, and AUSL to fully fund a bilingual coordinator position at my school next year when I leave. Our reasons are as follows. One, our ELL numbers entitle us to a full-time ELPT position. CPS schools with more than 200 ELL students are supposed to get full funding. We're currently at 207. The office of Ernesto Matias told our school that pre-K ELLs don't count in that. Problem with that is that every year when we're audited, one of the things we're checked on is whether we're providing ELL services to pre-K kids. How is it possible that we are being denied a full-time ELPT position while I, the ELPT, still have to give services to pre-K kids? Doesn't make sense. We ask that you address that discrepancy and count pre-K kids in our ELL numbers. Two our school has a tremendous and extraordinary need for a full-time ELPT. In just two years, our ELL numbers have increased from 17 to 39 percent of our students who do not speak English as a first language. We now have a number of newcomer and refugee students from Honduras and Guatemala who arrive with no coats, no boots, no beds. They need social workers. They need free legal representation. That has been a huge part of my job. If you don't fund an ELPT at my school next year, you are hurting those kids and families. Three, our school has seen a divestment from the ELL program, which marginalizes non-English speaking students and families. Our school has lost two bilingual AUSL coaches, has lost ESL classes for parents. We are now losing a, uh, a full ELPT position, and we know that this hurts our most vulnerable families. Since our school doesn't have an LSC, that budget was submitted by Piccolo administration with no voice and no vote for from the community. Th lastly, Mr. your Pence. Board of Education ruled and found in 2016 when we had only 134 ELs that we should have had a full-time ELPT. You can find that in, the, uh, in your audit from 2016 that we should have had a full-time with 134. Now with 207 plus refugees Mr. Pice, and newcomers, thank you're you telling for your us comments. that we can do it on a half-time. That's our not right. Thank our you next for speaker, the time. Please. Thank you.
Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Alejandra Santillán. Tengo una niña de seis años que estudia el primer año en la escuela Brian Picolo. Soy presidenta del BAC de la escuela de mi hija. Me gusta estar involucrada, ver y ayudar en todo lo que me es posible. Por eso vengo aquí para pedirles y demandar por un coordinador bilingüe a tiempo completo para nuestra escuela, ya que para el próximo año solo nos darán un coordinador a medio tiempo, lo cual perjudica a nuestros niños, ya que nuestra escuela cuenta con un 54.8% de niños hispanos, los cuales su lengua principal es el español. De ese porcentaje, 200 207 niños son ILS. Para ellos y para nosotros como padres será muy difícil entendernos con los demás maestros en las reuniones de nuestra escuela y en día de calificaciones y otros eventos. Por eso estoy aquí para pedirles su ayuda. Muchas gracias y feliz día. Hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is Alejandra Sandillan. Um, I have a six years old daughter in first grade that goes to Brian Piccolo. I'm the president of the Bilingual Advisory Committee at my child's school. I like being involved and helping in everything possible. That's why I'm here to demand that Piccolo could hire a full-time bilingual coordinator for our school, since next year we'll only have a part-time coordinator. Having a part-time coordinator will only harm our children because 54.8% of our students are Hispanics, whose native uh, language is Spanish, and 207 students of this percentage are enrolled in ESL program. It will be very difficult for parents and students to communicate with the teachers during meetings, report card pickup days, and other events. Because of this, I'm here to ask for your help. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Thank you. And our next speaker, please, uh, speaker number 20, uh, Tiffany Walters. Last call. Moving on to the next speaker, please, Melissa Ramirez Cooper. And before she begins, I will call speaker 22, please, Sue Fila, followed by speaker 25, Yolanda Williams, 34, Robin Booker, and 44, Kasim McDonald, please. Thank you. Please proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Ramirez Cooper, Director of Communication at the Illinois Network of Charter Schools. As our great city embarks on a new administration, INCS remains eager to deepen our support for our city's public schools and for initiatives that lift up our families. We also look forward to fostering a relationship with Mayor Lightfoot, as well as continue our partnership with CPS and our mutual commitment to ensuring that all of Chicago students are provided access to quality schools. At the last CPS board meeting, you heard from our community directly, and since then, we continue to make our voices heard. Two weeks ago, hundreds of parents and advocates of charter public schools gathered at the Illinois State Capitol as part of our 14th annual Lobby Day. We were there in full force to deliver an important message, and that is charter public schools change lives. On the steps of the Capitol building, proud families spoke about the incredible impact a charter education is having on their families. Cynthia Clark was beaming as she told the crowd that her daughter, Naja, a sophomore at Nobles Gary Comer College Prep, will attend a summer of a lifetime program at Washington University on a full scholarship. She said the opportunity would not have been possible without support from Chicago Public Schools. Cynthia also reminded the crowd that 98% of charter school students are children of color. In Springfield, she urged lawmakers to treat charter public schools fairly and fund them as they do other public schools. She said, and I quote, school choice is important to our families. Parents like me on the south side of Chicago deserve to have options. Choice is also important to parents like Nieves Hernandez, who has two children with special needs. They attend Roe Elementary, a level one plus charter public school. Her family's experience at Roe has inspired her to stand up in Springfield on behalf of other students with special needs. Everyone who showed up to make their voices heard did so on behalf of the nearly 65,000 families who have chosen a charter public education. Standing up for the rights of all families is more important than ever before, and INCS is committed to cutting through misinformation to amplify the voices of our families. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker, please. You ready? Good afternoon, members of the board. Thank you for having us today. My name is Robert Booker, and I am a sixth grade scholar at William Penn Elementary School. 
My name is Kasim McDonald, and I am also a sixth grade scholar at William Penn Elementary School. And we are here today to speak on behalf of our school because one of our bathrooms has been having multiple issues for a very long time. Mm -hmm. This bathroom is a large bathroom in the basement, not too far from our lunchroom. It has many issues. The stalls do not lock, many of the toilets are out of order, the sink is broken, so there is always water all over the floor. There is mold and algae growing on the walls, as you can see in the pictures we gave you. When the sink is not working, we have to use hand sanitizer or wash our hands at the nearby water fountain. The bathroom is also a co-ed with no dividers. Because of that, students are always rushed to get through, and this is unfair to all of us, but especially the girls. Worst of all, the bathroom smells very bad. The smell is so bad that sometimes it's carried through the vents to the lunchroom where we eat. The bathroom is a health hazard. We and our friends should not have to deal with this. We want to ask the board to please make sure that Penn gets the money to fix the bathroom for all the students. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry, tell me again. Uh, tell me your name again. Me? Yes, ma'am. Robin Booker. Robin. And young man? Kasim McDonald. Do you spell that with a K or an I C? C. C A S I M? C A S E A M. Okay, my, I have a grandson named Kasim. They, have, they have one additional speaker, Mr. Oh, President. Do they? Yes. Okay, before I make my comments, then please. Yolanda Williams, please. Good afternoon, members of the board. Thank you for having us today. My name is Yolanda Williams, and I'm a parent a LSC member, and a PAC president for William Penn Elementary School in the North Lawndale area. I am here today to speak on behalf of Penn Elementary, which has been dealing with a terrible bathroom situation for many years now. You've just heard the narrative from our two student representatives. The bathroom situation has been a concern for parents and students in the school community. There has been some movement in the last few weeks on getting this problem fixed for which we are thankful to CPS and the board. Several representatives from contractors have been in contact with us about the issue. We know that a small scope is being considered that will put a wall in the bathroom to split, up, split it up for the boys and the girls. However, even that limited scope has yet to be approved for funding. We are here to please ask that you make PN a priority when considering capital funding for our schools. Thank you for putting this at the top of your agenda. Penn is a high-performing elementary school. We believe that the terrible condition of this bathroom is sending a message to students and parents that CPS and the school district do not care about them. Recently, a student was heard saying about the bathroom, this is what we get because we live in the hood. It is unfair and inequitable for these students to have to learn in these conditions. We hope that you will, you will encourage, support, and fund a full renovation of the bathroom at William Penn Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you um, first off, Arnie, I know you got this. Do you want to comment on it? The, uh, I should clarify, the funding has been identified. It's in design, and it will be put out to bid and completed this summer. But the funding is indeed there. Um, I, I, I wanted you to hear that. Uh, also, also the two young people that spoke, I, I'm just always so impressed when, when young people come up to the mic and speak so well. Both of you did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The next speakers then will be speaker number 28, please, Jamari Barnett. We'll have speaker number 30, Lorena Lopez, followed by speaker 49, Alma Silva, and then we will have speaker number 36, David Tolan. Please state your name. Good afternoon. My name is Taylor Wallace. I'll be speaking on behalf of Jamari. Excuse me. You can't see the time, Mr. President. Is Jamari, is Jamari Barnett here? Yes, Jamari is right here. Jamari should address the board, please. My name is Jamari. Uh, you say that you put children first. You say that you aim to provide a high quality public education for every child in every neighborhood that prepares each of us for success. 
You say that student safety is your number one priority. We're from South Shore International College Prep, representing Young Leaders Academy, the Tribal Council. We are here to address the community concerns about the pro proposed repurposing of the old South Shore High School building. We know that we're considering placing the old police and firefighter training facility in that building. We believe that it can be used to create the better opportunities for our youth and the community, such as trade programs, community engagement activities, performing spaces for the drama club, field house spaces for Rose Bloom Park, and more evening and weekend programs. This proposal provides a safe environment for youth to connect with their community. It can create an opportunity to bond, unite, and grow as a community. What was a neighborhood anchor in South Shore was lost when the old high school building was closed. It was left many floating and disconnected. This is an opportunity for us to repair that. We have collected signatures from our peers and the community. We suggest that you open discussion from repurposing the old South Shore building. And as the young leaders affected by this, we, de bleh, we deserve a seat at the decisions making table. So why not give us a seat? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. Uh, Arnie, are, are you aware of this? I'm aware of it. Uh, no final decision has been made on what the use of the building is going to be uh, intended for. At the end of the day, we're working with the city as well as community stakeholders to make sure you know we, we take into account exactly what they're noting. What is the overall consensus for the repurposing of the building from the community? Thank you. So, what will you do to uh, make sure that the youth in the community is are, are you a registered speaker? So what would you do to make sure that the community community and youth is involved in that? I, I think that you'll end up working with Arnie Rivera and his team. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, You're Mr. Well. President. Um, before, Ms. Um, Lopez, me permite un segundito? Sue Fila, please, if you could address the board, your speaker number 22. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Ombudsman, Educational Services, pleased to have the opportunity to speak before the board today about the approval of the contract for our ALOP options programs. Ombudsman stands committed to continuous improvement in our efforts to educate and serve the students of Chicago. Since Ombudsman partnered with Chicago Public Schools in 2013, 938 students have earned their CPS high school diploma. And we expect that number to grow beyond 1,000 as we close out this current school year. Uh, many of our students have gone on to college, the military, vocational training programs, and entered the workforce. A number of this year's graduates will be attending the City Colleges of Chicago. Several others have earned scholarships, um, such as the Star Scholarship, the Leadership Scholarship, and several scholarships, including the University of Chicago and St. Xavier University. Our students are also participating in Chicago Builds, Lumity Pre-Apprenticeship Programs, and Summer Jobs Programs. We are proud of all of our students and eager to continue our work with the support of Chicago Public Schools, students, parents, and community to prepare so, to provide some of the most at-risk students in Chicago an alternative path to graduation and post-secondary success. Our professional staff ensures students receive rigorous academics to meet CPS graduation requirements. We also partner with community organizations to ensure students participate in meaning meaningful post-secondary programs to identify their goals after graduation and to be there to meet them. We provide comprehensive social-emotional learning to all students in partnership with CPS <clears throat> and other community agencies. Students receive counseling, mentoring. Ms. Fila? I'll wrap up. Thank you. Um, student success is our number one priority and we'll continue to to work alongside CPS and the community to ensure that our students are receiving the best care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll proceed with speaker number 30, please, Lorena Lopez. Mi nombre es Lorena Lopez. Tengo dos hijos en las escuelas públicas, uno que se graduó ya este año y una niña en sexto grado. 
Nosotros como padres no habíamos escuchado sobre la solicitud para propuesta del programa RFP hasta el mes pasado en una reunión con Kids Fear Chicago. Estamos agradecidos de tener este recurso para implementar programas académicos, pero nos gustaría que esta información sea dispersada más ampliamente. Por ejemplo, nos gustaría que esta información llegue a la comunidad escolar a través del Concilio Local Escolar, LS, LSC, o el Community Action Concilio, CAC. No es suficiente que el director de la escuela sea el único responsable de la información, ya que los padres somos los más interesados en que nuestros hijos obtengan los mejores recursos para su éxito. Teniendo a los padres y maestros involucrados, es más probable que esta información sea utilizada para obtener los programas eficazmente. Al incluir a la comunidad escolar, el director es acontavo y no puede ignorar, no puede ignorar si ciertos programas que se necesitan, ya que ellos son los responsables de la función de programas dentro de las escuelas. Para que el proceso de añadir programas académicos sea más, más equitable, necesitamos que se facilite el acceso a la información, especialmente en áreas de la ciudad donde hay menos inversión y menos programas. Gracias. We parents did not hear about the academic program request for proposal until last month in a, in a Kids First Chicago meeting. We're happy to have this resource to implement academic programs, but we'd like for this information to be spread more widely. For example, we would like for this information to reach the school community through LSC and or the CAC. It is not enough that the principal is the only individual responsible for this information, given that as parents, we are more committed to helping our children access the best resources for their success. Having parent and teacher involvement increases the probability of a school to efficiently utilize the information to implement academic programs. By including the school community mentioned, the principal is held accountable to having a conversation about academic programming and will not be able to disregard our needs for certain programs. To make this a more equitable access a more equitable academic programming process, we need to have the application information to be more readily accessible, especially in areas of the city that experience disadvancement and the lack of academic programs. Thank you. Thank you, and their next speaker is speaker 49, please, Alma Silva. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alma Silva y como mamá de tener hijos en CPS, a mi compañera Lorena y yo estamos aquí para hablar del proceso del uh, Request for Proposal para las escuelas. El proceso del uh, Request for Proposal es muy complicado de realizar para la mayoría de nuestras escuelas de bajos recursos en las comunidades con la necesidad más grande de los programas. Si el propósito de, es traer e equitatividad a estas comunidades, El proceso necesita adaptarse y ser más accesible. Nosotros creemos que para incrementar la utilidad de, las, de la solicitud de propuesta RFP, el timeline del proceso de CPS debería empezar más temprano y debería te, de hacer más sesiones de información, especialmente en áreas de más necesidad de, de programas basados en ARA. Dentro del timeline sugerimos que el RFP release Empiece en agosto antes de, de que empiece el año escolar en vez de octubre. Las sesiones de información deben incluir a los miembros del Concilio Local Escolar LSC y o al CAC Community Action Council. Estas sesiones deben empezar en septiembre, ya que la aplicación es muy extensa y complicada. Pensamos que un año para aplicar es muy largo en caso de que nuestras escuelas no sean elegibles. Queremos que siga la secuencia de la aplicación a través del año. Queremos que la información llegue a la comunidad escolar más allá, no solo a los directores. También queremos extender el tiempo de preparación para el proceso de la aplicación y así incrementar la posibilidad de que los programas lleguen a las escuelas. ¿Sería posible ver estos cambios reflejados en el año 2020-2021? 
Hi, my name is Alma Silva. The RFP process is too complicated for our most under-resourced schools in the highest need communities to complete. If the goal is to bring equity to those communities, the process needs to accommodate them by being more accessible. We believe that one way to fully utilize the RFP application will be to start the timeline portion of the process earlier and to have more information sessions, especially in areas with greater academic programming needs as indicated in the current year's ARA. Within the timeline, we suggest the RFP release begin in August instead of October before school starts. The information sessions should include the LSC and the CAC. This session should start in September instead of October. Considering that the RFP application is extensive and complicated, we think a year for the application process is a very long period for schools that might not have their proposals accepted. Overall, we'll like the information for the RFP application to reach our school communities more widely. We would like to see the preparation time for the application be extended to an earlier start. These considerations will help increase the possibility of excellent academic programs reaching our schools. Is there a possibility to see these changes reflected in the 2020-2021 school year? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll continue. Uh, the next speaker then is Speaker 36, please, David Tolan. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm David, and I'm going to tell you a phrase that probably so, some of you might be familiar. There were 10 that were healed, but just one came back to say thank you. It's the Bible. And last year, I was here to ask for help from you. And I'm very happy to tell you how it was received. Uh, the fingerprinting issue, a resolution was passed in the Senate, and now it's in the third reading on the House. So we are very hopeful that your action was taken seri seriously overall uh, across Chicago, and now that action that you took is helping over 200,000 families that were affected for it. For that, I thank you the board, I thank you Mrs. Jackson, uh, McDell, and all the staff that make this possible. That was great. Um, well, the second issue that I'm here to, to, to say, to mention, is like, we have a situation in, in a Reyes Party School. We have a school who has capacity for over 600 students, and is only holding 126. So something is not right. And my friend over here, Annie, and I, and a group of people from the neighborhood, we are trying to make changes, positive changes for our children. And we come up with a, come up with a solution. We are member of the LSC, a new field, who has a capacity also for 600,000, I mean 600 students, and we have 600 and plus, and we are uh, uh, a one, oh, what's that? One plus uh, school. So we want, we would like to bring our administration to this school before, Mr. before schools, um, before children just keep quitting the school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Cohen. Do I take it that uh, that biblical reference you made that you're you're the one of the ten? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, Marcus, um, um, uh, when the Jesus uh, healed 10 people who were like uh, with the disease of lepra, I don't know how to say lepra in English, lepra, and uh, the 10 guys just went back to their houses, but one guy came back to say, thank you, thank you Jesus, and, and that is a thank you for all of you and for all of you. I hope this uh, is going to make your life do you day brighter. <laughs> <laughs> and and thank, thank you for offering a solution to our, uh, an issue. We appreciate please, that, too. Please, please, pay attention to our work. We're paying attention. Situation. All right. Thank Have you. Our, our next group, Mr. President, will be speaker number 37, please, Marisol Gonzalez, followed by speaker 51, Jose Villa. We then move on to speaker 38, Paula Ventura, speaker 40, Mayra Hernandez, and 41, Angel Rivas.
Before I start, can I ask permission to have the rest of our community that's in the observation room to come in, please? Security, can you please get the Sir Juana group into the boardroom? As you can see, we have a big community mm -hmm. <laughs> support. Okay, Ms. Gonzalez, you can start. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marisol Gonzalez. I am a Sor Juana parent. First, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. And if you were involved in the establishment of Sor Juana Elementary on the southwest side of the city, I wanna say thank you for finding Ms. Megan Kerr to be the leader of Sor Juana. I can speak for all of the families and say that we are there and took a chance on a brand new school because of Ms. Kerr's passion and leadership. I was born in Mexico City and brought to the States at a young age. I am a finance manager at a pretty big company not too far from here, and I believe the key to success is education. That is why the establishment of Sor Juana with a classical program was such a blessing to discover last year, um, especially for us, for our second grader, Emma. Um, especially since we also have a high schooler at John Hancock, the only selective enrollment high school on the southwest side of the city. We feel that Sor Juana and the classical program can serve as the pipeline to John Hancock. As a parent, my job is to find the best available resources of education for my children. We live on the southwest side of the city and our community deserves a place near us where kids have the opportunity to live up to their full potential. A place like Sor Juana established to offer a dual educational program, both STEAM and classical, to fill the void on the southwest side. My ask of you today is simple. The Sor Juana community needs your partnership and support in making sure that the classical program at Sor Juana be recognized as we were promised. The CPS leaders, that CPS leadership walk the talk. We need you to believe in our kids, believe in our community that are with us today. We invite you all to come and visit Sor Juana and experience how great it is for yourself. Mr. Heigemegzan, I know that you grew up in Little Village. I grew up in Little Village myself, but you are you know, one of very, very few with such an impressive educational background. Thank I know you, you understand Gonzalez. the need, and I hope it's your mission as part of the board. Thank you, and they have one additional speaker, please. Speaker 51, Jose Villa. All right, before I start, I just want to say uh, happy birthday, and mm -hmm. thank you to the board, and thank you to everybody else. Dade, thank you. I actually had uh, this whole well-written speech. Um, sorry, my name is Jose Villa. I'm a parent at Sir Juana. I had this whole well-written speech about how I was going to explain how many volunteers we had at Sir Juana and, you know, everything we've done with the community and the way we need to work together. And after hearing everyone's speech and everything and seeing the people that were up here, especially the students that we acknowledged at the very beginning, I really tell you, I mean, it's we're losing more and more families, especially on the southwest side, to the suburbs, to private schools. I speak, to, I stand up here now speaking as one of those families. Um, again, I, I'm very truthful when I say the things that I say, and I've told the parents, I go, I understand not, not everyone has the resources to leave and go to private schools or go to the suburbs. Unfortunately, those who do, they seek out those programs. Sor Juana, we took a chance with. My, my wife convinced me to take a chance at Sor Juana. I was dead set on private school. I took a chance at Sor Juana. The principal there, the vice principal, the staff they assembled has a great program. And if we need to continue that classical program, if they delay it, I know they're saying that it's gonna continue, but if the program is delayed, many more families such as myself, we're gonna look out elsewhere. And we don't need to do that. We need to believe, here, I'll give you a little insert of what I said. It's time to, it's time to change the mindset that CPS is inadequate for the children to excel academically. To change the mind of those who seek private schools and that flee to the suburbs and in search of better programs. Time to make people believe that CPS can grow children from kindergarten to careers. The other gentleman spoke earlier that 
not everyone's meant to go to college. It's true. We're not all astronauts. We're not all meant to be astronauts, but we can all soar. We can all get to certain heights. The, the biggest thing is that we need those programs. The classical program in the southwest side is lacking. Everything else is very far away. It's a great distance. And how can you build a community Thank you, Mr. Villa. someone else 10 miles, 20 miles away? Thank you, for your, thank you for your thank comments. Thank you for your time. Mr. Thank President, you. I was just informed there's one additional speaker with the group. Please, Speaker 40, Mayra Hernandez. Hello. My name is Mayra Hernandez. I am here today to speak about my son's school, Sor Juana Elementary. Sor Juana is located in the West Elsa neighborhood on the southwest side. In December 2017, Sor Juana was approved by the Board of Education to provide a combined classical and STEAM magnet program. Unfortunately, low enrollment has delayed the official opening for this up-and-coming school's classical program. We are pleased that the Office of Access and Enrollment has expressed their commitment of launching the classical program upon adequate enrollment. The Sor Juana community is ready to partner with CPS to ensure this is achieved. We are thrilled to have, the, we are thrilled to have this amazing classical and STEAM program. Even with Sor Juana only being in its primary year, word is spreading about the amazing things happening at our school. We are engaged parents and are looking forward to collaborating with CPS. We believe by joining together, we can ensure Sor Juana's thriving program reaches its full potential. Sor, Juana, Sor Juana's classical and STEAM program is the first of its kind for Chicago's Southwest Side. Other programs with classical and or STEAM options are more than 10 miles away for a majority of the Southwest Side families. 95% of Sor Juana families live within a five mile radius of the school. Our school has 92 students. There are 82 parent volunteers. We believe this speaks volumes about the parent staff relationships within our Sohana community. <laughs> we are grateful to have Dr. Janice Jackson as our CEO who supports growing schools. We are thankful that former Mayor Emanuel supported the opening of Sohana Classical and Steep School. We are very fortunate that Mayor Lightfoot's education plan is exceptionally promising. We are eager to work with Mayor Lightfoot to ensure that the components of her education plan are successful at Sor Juana. Mayor Lightfoot values having high quality educational opportunities in every neighborhood. We are dedicated to join together with the Chicago Public School Board of Education to ensure that Sor Juana maintains its classical you, and school Hernandez. programming as it is an example of world class education. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me and we look forward to working together. Thank you for your comments. It's very impressive to see such a strong uh, outpouring of community. Uh, that that uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, gets everyone's attention. And uh, I know that uh, Chief McDade is aware of your situation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, next, the next speaker, please, 38, Paula Ventura. Hola, miembro de la Junta de la Escuela Pública de Chicago. Me llamo Paula Ventura, soy representante de padres de LSI Yotman STEM School. Somos muy afortunados de haber recibido una subsección que nos ayudó a convertirnos en Escuela Magnet de STEM. Nuestros niños están haciendo grandes cosas en sus escuelas y aprendiendo mucho. Sin embargo, nuestro edificio necesita muchas reparaciones. La prioridad es una escuela segura para nuestros niños y comunidad. En este momento hay una pintura descarapelándose en, a base de plomo y baldosas que deben representarse. <coughs> en una de nuestras habitaciones las baldosas se están rompiendo tan, tan mal que una aula cerró y la maestra se, se tuvo que cambiar de aula eh, hace unas pocas semanas. Tengo entendido que nuestra directora ha estado en contacto con CPS, se desó tratando de arreglar las cosas por algún tiempo, pero esta, hasta la fecha no se ha dado respuestas, una línea de tiempo de cuánto se pueda abordar las cosas. Como padres preocupados y miembros de LSI, y miembros de la comunidad de Pilsen, le pido a la Junta que haga un seguimiento de nuestras solicitudes para hacer nuestra escuela 
segura y que nos informen un plan para abordar los problemas importantes, especialmente nuestros pasillos, aulas que no tienen pintura descarapelada, nuestro espacio de gimnasio con problemas de pintura, el, el techo de una oficina de una maestra de gimnasio que el techo está cayéndose, el piso de un salón que se está hundiendo y finalmente el parque, el parque de los niños de juegos que está todo dañado. Por favor, ayúdenos con, esta, con nuestra escuela. Muchas gracias. Hello, Chicago Public School Board members. My name is Paula Ventura, and I'm a LSC as a parent representative for John Men STEM Magnet School. We're very fortunate to have received a grant that helped us become a STEM Magnet School. Our kids are doing great things in their classrooms and learning a lot. Our building, however, is in need of many repairs. The priority is a safe school for our children and community. Right now, there is peeling paint that is lead-based and tiles that need to be fixed. In one of our rooms, the tile is breaking apart so badly that the classroom was closed down and the teacher was moved down the hallway just a few weeks ago. It is my understanding that our principal has been in contact with CPAs and Sokdiso trying to get things fixed for some time, but to date, there have not been answers given or even a timeline of when things can be addressed. As a concerned parent, LSC member, and Pilsen community member, I'm begging that the board follow up on our request to make our school safe and let us know a plan to address the significant issues, especially our gym space that has chipping and peeling paint and tile floor issues, the ceiling in the gym teacher's office that is coming down, the floor in the teacher's lounge that is sinking, and finally, our pay, play lot is at least 25 years old. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'll continue, Mr. President. Speaker number 55, please, Angelica Cordova. We will then have speaker number six, Laura Vergara, 58, Andrea Tulsman, and the last speaker, speaker 60, David Pavletic. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es, soy Angélica, soy padre de la Academia de Padres Liderazgo de Pilsen Neighbor y madre de la Escuela Wiria. Estamos aquí una vez más exigiendo una, una respuesta sobre la, el estatus imán híbrido de nuestra escuela. Señor, señor sigue, se nos sigue aplazando. Queremos que ya sea, se pongan a votar, a votación, la, si van a hacerlo, nos van a continuar ignorando. Estamos cansados. My name is Angelica. I am a member of the uh, Pilsen Neighbors uh, Academy of Parents and Leadership and I'm also a mother of Whittier School. We're here once again demanding uh, an answer regarding the status of a magnet school for our, for our school, Whittier. Uh, we're continuously being stepped upon. We're tired. We want uh, you all to vote on the status of our school because we are very, very tired of being ignored. También estamos aquí con la escuela Talco, Talco, que nos está aquí apoyando y está por lo de su parque. Ya mandaron correos a ustedes y necesitan saber que una respuesta sobre la continuación. Por favor, queremos que vayan a ver esa escuela. Um, Gracias a la señorita por recordarnos que somos latinos y debemos romper las cadenas. We are also here with the Talcott School who have been uh, supporting us in our struggle. They also have been uh, sending very many emails, letters uh, regarding um, 
regarding uh, a park. Regarding a park for their school, and they need to know, they want to find out what the uh, code is for uh, this restoration. Uh, thanks to um, the Senorita Garza, who recorded that we are Latinos, and that to break our chains, we had to learn English. And that's why we brought our interpreters and uh, our audiophones also, so that we'd be able to understand what all is going on here. Okay, anything else as well? And we hope that you all have more interpreters. I understand that there's just one uh, interpreter for Spanish, Jessica. We need more Spanish uh, translators and uh, for other languages as well. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker, Mr. President, then is speaker 56, please, Laura Vergara. Last call. Moving on to speaker 58, Andrea Tolzman, please. Good afternoon, my name is Andrea Tolzman and I'm a parent at Pulaski International and a board member with Raise Your Hand. On Monday, Chicago welcomed a new mayor and hopefully entered an era of reform, equity in education, stability and integrity. We also heard a promise to end corruption and clout contracts in the city's governmental bodies. Chicago ain't ready for reform, well reform is here. To begin, let's reform how CPS approaches capital spending with its Band-Aid approach. Pulaski's principals and engineer have been, engineers have been dealing with chronic heating and cooling and air circulation and quality issues in the classrooms that use Univent systems. Pulaski appreciates the response from CPS facilities and the new insurance quality department, yet despite nearly daily maintenance problems reported throughout the years on these 20 plus year old units, which have a lifespan of 15 years, the CPS response is to only replace eight of the existing 17 units. The remaining outdated units will require special order parts and trained technicians to be contracted daily and regularly to continue, continue repairing them, which is not cost effective, not a good use of staffing resources, and not a fiscally responsible plan for spending capital funds. This should not be an acceptable option to this board. I ask facilities to please reconsider the choice to replace only some of the units, do not prolong the inevitable of the rest of the units, and just get the job done. Mayor Lightfoot's promise to prioritize equitable education for each and every one of our children is a foundation for the future of the city. It's exciting and we're filled with cautious optimism. It's time that this board let a new administration with a new vision and ideas begin to reform the process of providing a safe, relevant, and challenging education for our children. Mayor Lightfoot's education team needs to review and assess today's agenda items for equity and clout. Today's votes should be delayed. On page 308 of today's agenda, Another $55.5 million contract over three years for Jacobs Project Management will be voted on. Raise Your Hand has repeatedly drawn attention to this board about this CPS clout contractor since 2015, when analysis of these contracts showed that outsourcing project management to clout contractor contractors like Jacobs and a list of other subcontracts Ms. Tilsman. I'm finishing up. With associated scandals that stretch back to the daily administration adds almost 120% to the construction costs. Well, CPS ain't ready for reform, but reform is here. In the days that you have left on this board, it's time to stop rubber stamping clout contracts like this and make room at the table for a new vision of equity, stability, and integrity when making decisions on behalf of our children. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker, Mr. President, speaker number 60, please, David Pavletic. Good afternoon, President Clark. Uh, good afternoon and happy birthday, Dr. Jackson, and good afternoon to the rest of the board. My name is David Pavletic. And I'm a junior at Whitney Young Magnet High School, and today I'm speaking on behalf of the Whitney Young Solar Initiative. Uh, for the past two years, we as students of Whitney Young have been uh, working very hard to get this city on track to a more environmentally friendly future. We uh, regularly partner with the Illinois chapter of the Sierra Club. We participate in lobbying events uh, throughout the city as well as in Springfield. Uh, we lead, uh, sh we lead uh, youth leadership uh, trainings and we also provide environment, or we uh, promote environmental discourse. We are speaking to you on, we're speaking today uh, with a plan for our school. In light of the Ready for 100 uh, re resolution which w mandates the transition of Chicago public schools to clean energy, we promote a pilot program which will transition our school to solar energy and serve as a viable model for the entire district's energy strategy. Our team of Whitney Young students has been working closely for the past 10 months with 
corporate solar providers who specifically reached out to us in support of the student-led initiative. Winnyang High School wants to collaborate with a corporate solar provider to install solar panels on our roofs for zero dollars down. In exchange, CPS would pay the electricity bill for our school building to that solar provider instead of Constellation Energy. The switch, is, uh, the switch to green energy is imperative, uh, and implementing a deal like this at our school could serve as a cost-effective model for the entire district's energy strategy. We have already received the enthusiastic uh, uh, unanimous uh, support of the Whitney Young administration as well as our local school council. What we seek from you today uh, as the board is a commitment to this proposal and a willingness to cooperate with the Whitney Young community on this pilot project. The next step uh, would be to help our engineers obtain a copy of Whitney Young's utility bill so we can conduct a full cost benefit Mr. analysis. Pavletic? I'm wrapping up. Uh, transitioning our building to solar energy. We would also like uh, to know what, who exactly at CPS is in charge of sustainability strategy and fulfilling the city's commitment to transition of all government buildings to clean energy by 2025. Uh, CPS should cooperate with Whitney Young community to implement this clean energy pilot program uh, as smoothly as possible. We also ask for transparency uh, throughout the implementation of the student-led initiative. Thank you for your time. You're more than welcome. Arnie, are, are you... Uh, yeah, we actually just hired a new sustainability person. That good. Would love to come out there. I mean, this guy may have a big job. Okay. But we would love, you know, by the end of the school year to be up to what your school year is. That'd be great. Thank you very much. You're all students? Yes. yes. Very, very impressive. All right. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes public participation. Okay. Board members, do we have any other questions, comments on, on presentations? All right, well, this concludes our public participation section. And before we go into executive session, um, I am going to make an announcement. Uh, this is the last meeting of this sitting board. Uh, the June board uh, will have a different board impaneled. Uh, it's been an honor um, and, and at times even a pleasure uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, serve the students of the city of Chicago uh, to work with this current administration uh, under Dr. Jackson's leadership. Uh, we're very, very proud of the work of this board, the reduction of the billion dollar deficit to uh, virtually zero, uh, the constant uh, continued ac uh, academic achievement under Dr. Jackson's leadership um, and ultimately uh, dealing with the very sensitive issue around the sexual abuse, I would say without any hesitation, uh, the structure, the process, the systems that are in place uh, will uh, be able to address those issues much more rigorously than we have in the past. Uh, and having all said that, I would simply say really truly uh, thank you. Uh, this is a uh, privilege to sit up here uh, and to uh, uh, frankly serve the city of Chicago and 360,000 students. Thank you very much. You treat us nice because we're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Mr. President, I understand CEO Dr. Jackson would also like yeah. to make a few remarks. Yeah, I didn't know if the other board members wanted to say anything. But um, on behalf of Chicago Public Schools Management and Leadership, I just want to thank uh, President Clark for your service mm -hmm. and also want to collectively thank this board. I can say that I have felt both challenged and supported in this role, and you all have served um, with integrity, um, and you pushed us to be better. So just know that you're leaving CPS in a stronger place than you found it. And whether that is, um, you know, pushing us to make sure we are uh, meeting our goals around MWBE, um, Dr. Hines' favorite question around principals' involvement and in, in students, um, just the expertise that this board has has um, displayed has really made me a better leader and made us a stronger team. And uh, I just wanted an opportunity to thank you all together um, since this your President Clark is announcing this is his last meeting. So obviously it's the last time all of you will be here together. Um, I just want to thank you for your service and just say I know it isn't an easy road. And despite what people may have said, you didn't have to do this. And I just thank God that you did. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. And one last thing, uh, President Clark, please. 
thank yeah. your wife. I want to go on the record with that because I know <laughs> she took some convincing. And I appreciate the fact that she allowed um, us to, to borrow you for a little while. So please give her my regards on behalf of the district. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as Frank always remind me, I am the longest serving <laughs> board member. He doesn't say I'm old, <laughs> thank God. So what I would like to do is really thank God for allowing me to uh, do this work. It is really a privilege. And I wanna go publicly thanking Rahm Emanuel for appointing me to the board eight years ago. I said no to him twice but he reminded me that I would only have to do it for 18 months. He lied. <laughs> but I want to thank him. I want to thank the board chair. Frank, it's been an honor to serve you. When I talk to people about you, I say you're a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And I mean it in both sense of the words. You are a gentleman, and you are a brilliant, brilliant board chair. It's truly been an honor. To my fellow board members, I want to say thank you. It's been an honor. You have informed me, you have challenged me, and you have taught me how to compromise. I definitely, to the board staff, Estelle, all of you, I want to thank you for your service. You have really taken care of all of us at a very high level. And I definitely want to say thank you to all of the parents who come and take their time to be here. Whether I agree with you or not, you have helped me to grow. And I will truly miss a few of these. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, I would like to thank Dr. Jackson and her team. You are a model for what educators ought to be. And I would thank you for not just saying you're putting children first. That's a slogan. You and Latanya and the rest of you, you live it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll just, I'll be brief, but I won't be nearly as eloquent as oh. my fellow board members here. Um, I think a lot of you know I started off my career as a CPS teacher. I think that's something, a perspective that I've wanted to bring on the board. This is my third stint at CPS. Started off as a teacher, worked at the district for uh, three years, and then now on the board for three and a half years. This has been uh, a privilege for me to be able to contribute in this way. Um, I think the city has benefited from this board. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think from Frank and Mark's management and financial expertise, mm -hmm. from Gail and Mahalia's educator expertise. Alex has been with me to a ton of community meetings. Yeah. Uh, Austin, you're an educator as well, and you have a great sense of humor. <laughs> uh, so I've appreciated that. And, and you know, I, I think that um, we're going to be rooting for CPS, and we're going to be rooting for yes. this management team. Yes. And Janice, we're going to be rooting for you. Yeah. Latanya, we're going to be rooting for you. I, I mean, once a CPS or always a CPS or I will always be rooting for CPS. Yes. And I'm proud of what we've accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last January, I got a call from Mayor Rahm Emanuel and said, would you like to uh, serve on the uh, Chicago Board of Education because a certain individual whose place I came in to fill uh, was moving on to a better opportunity. I won't mention the gentleman's name, but he's over there. Uh, but thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to serve uh, the children of Chicago. I wish uh, all the best to Dr. Jackson, her team, um, educators, families, and students for continued success. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one, one last recognition uh, that uh, uh, needs to be stated uh, before we go in and, uh, and go into executive session. Um, the um, Whenever the board uh, looks completely prepared, and frankly, uh, it, it, it appears that we have a pretty good idea of what we're talking about, uh, that's almost always the work of the staff for the board, uh, led by Abigail Joseph, uh, who is just an absolute... <laughs> I, 
and and some of us are, are not good at knowing where we're supposed to be and when we're supposed to be there, um, and, and and then to get there on time, and then we have Yoli who just helps us out, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we appreciate her. <laughs> and the board secretary and the assistant secretary, mm -hmm. um, there are probably very few irreplaceable people, but you may be that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. And, and both of you, both of you uh, are just greatly appreciated. Thank you. We appreciate you. Okay. Aww. And and lastly, and this really is the last thing, um, the, uh, since Dr. Jackson filled the room with people who like us, uh, <laughs> I, I really want to thank you. Uh, it, it's, it's been a joy. Uh, I, 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 it really has been a joy because I've seen progress. Uh, it may be vanity, but I do believe this board leaves uh, the uh, CPS in a stronger and a better position. And the uh, leadership that we have in place now is nothing short, in my judgment, of extraordinary. extraordinary. So I want to thank you all, uh, and um, thanks for coming down. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. So, Mr. President, we can proceed with the motion to go yes. in the close. I, Dr. Hines, you have a motion. Yes. I move for the passage of motion number 190522M01 and the commencement of a closed session to consider matters permitted under Section 2C of the Open Meetings Act, subsections 1, 2, 5, 6, 8, 10, 11, and 21 as specified in the motion. Is there a second? I second the motion. Thank you. I'll proceed with a roll call. A member Furlong? Yes. A member Garza? Yes. Vice President Guzman? Yes. Member Dr. Hines? Yes. And uh, member Goolsby? Yes. And President Clark? Yes. We have six ayes, zero nays. Okay, the meeting will now go into closed session. The meeting of the Board of Education is reconvened. Madam Secretary, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President, and I will start with closed session items from the General Council, and I will begin with new and continued council retentions. These items do require a vote. The first report authorized retention of the law firm Salvatore Prescott and Porter PLLC for new. The second report authorized continued retention of the law firm Franzic PC. Third report authorized continued retention of the law firm Riley Safer Homes and Concilla LLP. The fourth report authorized continued retention of the law firm Taft, Stetanius, and Hollister LLP. The fifth report authorized continued retention of the law firm Borkin and Scahill LTD. The sixth report is authorized continued retention of the law firm Pugh, Jones, and Johnson PC. And the seventh report authorized continued retention of the law firm Thompson and Coburn LLP. Mr. President, these items do require a vote. Is there a motion? So moved. <laughs> is there a second? Mr. Coos? Coosby. Which yeah, page? Right I here. second the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Page nine. Page. Uh, we'll proceed with a roll call. We have uh, Member Furlong. Yes. Uh, Member Garza. Yes. Vice President Guzman. Yes. Member Dr. Hines. Yes. Member Goolsby. Yes. And President Clark. Yes. We have six ayes, zero nays. I will continue with settlements, and these items do require a vote. The first report is the workers' compensation payment for lump sum settlement for Kathleen Wainick, Levin, Leventman, case number 10 WC 42961. The second report is the workers' compensation payment for lump sum settlement for Terry Johnson, case number 08 WC 055026. The third report is the workers' compensation payment for lump sum settlement for Joyce Jefferson, case numbers 14 W. WC 14026 and 15 WC 28821. The fifth report is the workers' compensation payment um, <laughs> payment for lump sum settlement for Delphine Gamble, case number 17 WC 005761. The fifth report is the personal injury authorized payment of settlement for SJA minor by her mother by her mother, uh, Shireen Contreras, uh, case number 17L000061. The sixth report is the personal injury authorized payment of settlement for John Doe's one through six, case number 17L011476, 17L011477, 17L011479, 17L011480, 17L011481, 17L011482. The seventh report is the approved settlement of Nicole Jones' tenure teacher dismissal case. The eighth report is approved payment of proposed settlement regarding Kim Amons versus board case number one. Um, 
16 CV 04884 and the ninth report property tax appeal refund authorized settlement for 15-34 283 16 373 91 and 17 32 558 for the address located at 2112 North Ashland Avenue Roundy Supermarkets Inc. Mr. President these items do require a vote. If there, if there are no objections from my fellow board members, please apply the last favorable roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll continue with law personnel matters. These items do require a vote, and we have uh, the first report is amend board report 190424AR15, transfer and appoint senior assistant general counsel, Department of Law for Kashasha Williams Board. The second report is transfer and appoint senior assistant general counsel, Department of Law for Peter Briarton. Mr. President, these items do require a vote. If there are no objections from my fellow board members, please apply the last favorable roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll continue with items from the Chief Executive Officer and proceed with talent, a talent recommendation and warning resolutions. These items do require a vote. We have transfer and appoint Chief Officer Language of Cultural Education, effective July 1, 2019, for Jorge Macias. And under warning resolutions, the first report is the warning resolution for Barney McCarthy, tenured teacher assigned to George F. Cassell Elementary School. The second report, warning resolution, Leanne Miller, tenured teacher teacher assigned to Marie Sklodowska Curie Metropolitan High School and the third report warning resolution Jill White tenure teacher assigned to Alice Bernard Elementary School and the fourth report is the warning resolution for Corey Moore tenure teacher assigned to Dunn Technology Academy and Mr. President these items do require a vote. If there are no objections from my fellow board members please apply the last favorable roll call vote. Thank you Mr. President I'll continue with items from the board and these items do require a vote and we have the first report as the resolution approving the chief executive officer's recommendation to dismiss educational support personnel. Uh, we have the second report, uh, resolution approving chief executive officer's recommendation to dismiss probationary appointed teachers. And for the record, I would like to note that on May 17, 2019, the board members and the office of the board received the CEO's recommendation to dismiss probationary appointed teachers pursuant to board rule 4-1 and <coughs> 105 ILCS 5 slash 34-84. Her recommendation included the names of the teachers affected and the reason that she also noted that the teachers affected will be notified of their dismissal after adoption of the resolution. The third report is is the resolution to approve the Chief Executive Officer's recommendation to dismiss non-renew probationary appointed teachers at the end of the 2018-2019 school year. And for the record, Mr. President, I would like to note that on May 17, 2019, the board members and the office of the board received the CEO's recommendation to dismiss probationary appointed teachers pursuant to Board Rule 47B.2A and 105 ILCS 5-34-84. Her recommendation included the names of the teachers and, and the teachers affected and the reasons. She also noted that the teachers affected will be notified of their dismissal after adoption of the resolution. Mr. President, these items do require a vote. If there are no objections from my fellow board members, please apply the last favorable roll call vote. Thank you, and I believe Vice President Guzman has a motion, please. Yes, I move that the board adopt the minutes of the closed session meeting of April 24, 2019, pursuant to section 2.06 of the Open Meetings Act. Board members reviewed these minutes and determined that the need for confidentiality <coughs> exists. Therefore, the minutes of the closed session meeting held on April 24th, 2019 shall be maintained as confidential and not available for public inspection. Is there a second? Dr. Hines. Where? Um, oh, I'm right here. I'm sorry. It was closed. I second the motion. Thank you. I'll proceed with a roll call. Uh, Member Furlong. Yes. Member Garza. Yes. Vice President Guzman. Yes. Member Dr. Hines. Yes. Member Goolsby. Yes. And President Clark. Yes. Six ayes, zero nays, and I believe Board Member Furlong has a motion, please. I move that the record of proceedings of the board meeting of April 24, 2019, prepared by the board secretary, be approved and that such records of proceedings be posted on the Chicago Board of Education website in accordance with Section 2.06B of the Open Meetings Act. Is there a second? For the final time. I second the motion. <laughs> I'll proceed with the roll call. Member Furlong. Yes. Member Garza. Yes. Vice President Guzman. Yes. Member Dr. Hines. Yes. Member Goolsby. Yes. And President Clark. Yes. Six size zero nays. I will continue with one real estate item. This item does require a vote. Approve entering into lease agreement with Shopping Center BF LLC for use by Pierce Elementary Pre-K. Mr. President, this item does require a vote. If there are no objections from my fellow board members, please apply the last favorable roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I will continue with items on the public agenda and only read the board report numbers since the titles and board reports appeared on the public agenda. And I will begin with a resolution that does not require a vote, RS1. Mr. President, this item just needs to be accepted by the board. Please mark received and filed. 
Thank you. I'll continue with resolutions and one policy. These items do require a vote, and we have RS2, 3, and 4, and the policy P01. Mr. President, these items do require a vote. If there are no objections from my fellow board members, please apply the last favorable roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I will continue with communications, and these items do not require a vote. Uh, C01 is the communication regarding the location of the June 26, 2019 board meeting, and it reads, this is to advise that the regular meeting of the Board of Education schedule, scheduled for Wednesday, June 26, 2019 will be held at the CPS uh, Loop Office. The board meeting will begin at 1030. Public participation guidelines are available on www.cpsboe.org or by calling the board office at 773-553-1600. For the June 26, 2019 board meeting, advanced registration to speak and observe will be available beginning June 24th at 1030 a.m. and close on Tuesday, June 25th at 5 p.m. or until all slots are filled, you can advance register during the registration period by the following method online by phone or in person and to ensure equity of access to address the board an individual may not speak at two consecutive board meetings in the event an individual registers to speak at a consecutive board meeting the individual will not be called to address the board although advanced registration is recommended you can also register to observe a meeting um, on the day of the meeting via same day in person observer registration uh, at 42 West Madison Street lobby and the registration time opens up at 1015 and will remain open for the duration of the board meeting same day in person observer registration registrations are taken on a first come first serve basis as seats become available and the public participation segment of the meeting will begin as indicated on the meeting agenda and proceed for no more than the 60 registered speakers um, moving on to co2 mr. president this is the communication regarding the 2019 2020 schedule of regular board meetings for the Board of Education um, and um, I hear am I am here by submitting the 2019 2020 schedule of regular board meetings the board meetings will be held on the fourth Wednesday of each month unless otherwise noted uh, and as noted before, the board meetings will uh, be held at the CES loop office until uh, further notice. We will also uh, post this information on our website and on cpsboe.org and cps.edu accordingly. Um, and further, let the official record reflect that the 2019 20 20 planning calendar has been prepared in accordance with the Illinois uh, Meetings Act, Open Meetings Act, and will be available for public distribution. Mr. President, I'll continue with additional items on the public agenda that do require a vote. And we have um, EX1, 2, and 3. And for the record, I would like to note an abstention for President Clark and Board Member Goolsby on EX3. For President Clark, it's regarding DePaul University. And for uh, Board Member Goolsby, it's the University of Chicago and the University of Chicago Medicine. Uh, moving on to EX4, we then have EX5. And for the record, I would like to note abstentions for President Clark and Board Member Goolsby on EX5. Again, for President Clark, it's for DePaul University and for Member Goolsby for the University of Chicago on EX5. We then have ED1. One, two, moving on to PR one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And for the record, I would like to note an abstention for Dr. Hines on um, PR eight for Airmark Educational Services and the Hyde Park Hospitality LLC that's noted in the affirmative action section. Um, moving on to PR nine, we then have PR 10. And Mr. President, for the record, I would like to note that PR 10 has been revised and the final will be in the action. And I would like to note for the record that the um, FedEx Office and Print Services Inc. vendor uh, will be removed from that board report and the final will be in the action. We then have PR 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And Mr. President, these items do require a vote. If there are no objections from my fellow board members, please apply the last favorable roll call vote with the noted abstentions. Thank you, Mr. President. So noted. I will continue with additional items on the public agenda that do not require a vote. And we have PR 16, EX 6, 7, and AR 1. And Mr. President, these items just need to be accepted by the board. Please mark received and filed. Thank you, Mr. President. And there are no further items on the public agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.